have you ever felt? Are you listening? Damn. He's always talking about, like, that's one of the scariest dudes on the planet right there. <laughs> Bro, there's something in, in that that, yeah, I don't know. I'm not sure if it just doesn't tick right or what. Yeah, <laughs> but, yeah. yeah I mean, he guy's an absolute killer. I oh, mean, it would probably, yeah, it'd probably freak me out to talk to him, you know? Oh, yeah. So, I don't know. A little intimidation for sure. I know when uh, he was boxing, like, in his prime, he said, I was, like, so into hating the other boxer. Like, I wanted to, like, kill and hurt their family too like he's in such a bad mindset yeah to get him there and it's like and even like when he retired he's like man that was in a bad place i was a bad person but yeah he's scary in his prime that's for sure yeah i mean dude just like legit dangerous yeah i mean just some of those interviews like it was different like seeing him now and like you you see him in some of these episodes and you know that killer lives inside that brain somewhere yeah, yeah. I, but seeing him talk and like you know he's just so much more like mellow and mm -hmm. like like friendly you know and yeah. just like aware of himself in yeah. the world he, he, he and knows like, he's worked on it man he had to do some work but yeah you just go that's like a pit bull yes. you know, he's uh he seems calm right this second but <laughs> yeah and fucking kill you he could snap at any second <laughs> yeah i know he, yeah. he was talking about that like he had to find peace and but it's like rogan says man i mean <laughs> dude scary like, keep, just keep keep on your toes on that <laughs> sure yeah be aware for sure so man uh yo for everybody this is uh this is a uh, christian a friend of mine that um that's here in durango so a local guy right yeah. uh you guys should all should all hopefully know him from goods in the woods or goods for the woods yeah, yeah. and uh but i wanted to have you come on because i i mean obviously i follow you but we've been we've been friendly uh, kind of through the archery community um and uh, I think I was, you were doing something to my bow, restringing it or fixing something. I probably dry fired it and fucking shattered the cams. <laughs> <laughs> so, but anyways, it was interesting because like you were, I had just moved back up here from Texas. So I went down there to work, uh, quit that job because I fucking hated it. Mm -hmm. Moved back home during COVID. Um, goods pretty much started opening up back to the public right around then. And that's when I was like, oh man, let's get back into archery and. Um, but yeah, you had like told me something and it was, it was strange because you don't hear a lot of people say so. Like, this is like, you were like, I moved up to Colorado so I could hunt, so yeah. I could be, uh, get my residence license. Mm -hmm. And I was like, well, what, what? Yeah, you know? Yeah. And so I thought about that whenever, uh, I hit you up to come on the show. I was like, dude, I got to find out more about it. Cause it's a little bit crazy. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like we, I moved up here when I was a kid from Louisiana with my parents. Sure. But like, not everybody just leaves their home state to yeah. come to Colorado right. so they yeah. can elk hunt, man. It's definitely a big move, man. Um, I mean, I grew up in Texas, born and raised there, and I did. I hunted a little bit archery when I was younger. Um, but then when I got into school, it was basketball. I mean, through college and even a little, you know, semi-pro stuff. And I knew at one point, I've always been competitive and, like, goal-driven, motivated to work out for something. And I can kind of tell basketball, you know, my body and getting older, as far as a career, that was going to be hard for me to keep pursuing. So I wanted to, you know, do something. Archery was always something I liked growing up, kind of did off and on through school. And for whatever reason, I just had this thing in the back of my head right when I was about midway through college and then ending college. I, I need to get a bow again. I need to hunt. And at that point, I was in Texas. I hunted a lot of white-tailed deer, helped on ranches, um, got ranches set up there and you know i'd just put on sportsman's channel or outdoor channel or whatever was on tv and started watching these elk hunts and i was like man this is like the ultimate animal it's big you get all the meat the mountains i mean it's everything i picture in bow hunting is you know doing the spot and stock versus sitting in a tree stand or a blind uh, my brother actually lived here in durango um at that time he was kind of out cruising around with his daughter on a nice day. And I was in Texas working on a skid steer. And he called me and he goes, hey, man, what are you doing right now? And I said, well, I'm in a skid steer. It's about 100 degrees. The AC didn't work. There's dust everywhere. So my boss wanted me to have the windows closed so that, you know, just didn't get caked with dust inside. He goes, well, it's 70 degrees up here right now. You should come and visit. It feels good. And he had a condo at the, at the time at the Glacier Club. So... Kind of took it as, okay, I'm going to come up here, kind of long vacation, check it out. If I like it, I'm going to try to figure out a way to stay. And so Goods for the Woods, actually, I called before I moved up here. I got a hold of Eric, who's uh, the manager there. 
and just kind of talked to him and said, hey, I've never worked in a shop. I tinker with bows. I, I'm passionate about it. I love it. And whatever I can do to get my foot in the door to do this, this is, this is what I want to do. And his response was, well, when you get up here, you know, swing on by and we'll give, talk with you, maybe do an interview and then kind of see where that goes. And so I just kind of did, and you know, like a, a mental pro and con thing. Should I move? Should I not? And if there's any red flags, you know, don't, don't go forward with that move. And I mean, every little bitty thing, I just kept getting little, like fortune cookie things in this, which I'm not even ever big into is like the decisions you make right now are good for the move or something, you know, like yeah. along those lines, I'm like, that's kind of weird to where the point when I actually made the move up here, I had all my stuff. I mean, everything I can possibly fit in my truck in the bed, piled up in the mound, everything, you know, all the seats filled up and it's coming through New Mexico and it's a pretty straight shot down the highway and I can just see this black storm cloud kind of coming through and I was like, oh man, pretty much all the stuff that I, all my valuables there, it's about to get soaked. And I had most of the, you know, my computer and all the, you know, real important stuff inside the truck, but there's a lot of stuff in the bed. So I just kind of, I was like, man, this is kind of a rough start, you know, I'm going to get a little, get a little wet on the way up there, but about 10 minutes later, 10 miles before that, I got to that black cloud, it, it broke it, uh, <laughs> perfectly on either side of the highway and a rainbow went over. So in my mind, I was like, this is, this is the right move. I feel like this is the right direction I'm going. So yeah, I came up here, went to Goods, talked to Jane and Eric. Jane's the owner and she's had the business for, I think, 30 plus years now and started me kind of part-time that first week to see how I'd do and just kind of went with it from there. They, they, they liked my employment and kind of, I think I was there for about three years or so and started off just, you know, doing arrows, tying in peeps and just kind of simple stuff to, to the point where I'm, you know, restringing bows, someone blows up their bow or something. I can order the parts and, you know, basically build the whole thing. And then it's just, it just, everything about it, you know, just talking to customers, the clientele, you know, the, the relationships you form. Um, I mean, one of the best feelings for me is fletching some arrows or getting someone set up on a brand new bow, tuning it. That's shot or never shot, but the ones that never shot, it feels, it feels better because, you know, it's all new to them and um, kind of quickly, but a compound bow has a peep and a sight and there's a lot of things you have to line up and get to effectively shoot a target. So it could be overwhelming for someone new. So someone that comes in a month or two before season and they get, you know, all their gear set up. They practice for a few months and then they go out and harvest an elk and come back and, you know, either show me the arrow or tell me, I, I got, I got one with the bow you set up. It's, it's a good feeling. Um, I got to the point where, you know, going with friends and hunting is just as exciting and fulfilling as it is for me to shoot one, to know how much hard work, you know, to clean the animal out there, pack it back to the truck, how many miles that can be. And, and once you get to the table and, and process and stuff, I mean, that's, it's the best tasty meal to me because you know how, where it came from, how much work you put in. Um, and then, you, I mean, you're providing I an mean, elk. I, I provided tons of people last year with, you know, a, a steak cuts or hamburger. And it's just, it, it feels good for me to be able to give back something that I've harvested like that too. So yeah, that's kind of how it started, man, is I was Texas. I've been there for a long time. I've hunted a lot there and I just kind of saw, you know, mountains, didn't get to grow up with mountains. I didn't get to experience snow, elk hunting. And so I just, you know, just kind of took the risk and said, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this. This is what I want to do and kind of jumped for it. And another big uh, push to help me make that decision was my basketball coach in high school. Always, I mean, he was like 6'4", six, 6'5", six, pretty big guy. And then about a year before I moved up here, he got cancer and the team would get together every now and again. We'd go visit him. And just kind of sit on the couch or, you know, talk to him about old games or what he was doing lately. And one of my good friends, Cody Cox, was like, Coach, I got a question for you. If there's anything you can tell us throughout your life experience-wise, like what, what can you give us, a, you know, advice going forward from here? And he kind of sat for like five seconds. You could tell he thought about hard. And, and he's like, what, whatever it is you've wanted to do, fishing, whatever, do it now before you're not able to. Because now he goes, I want to go fishing so bad, but I'm so weak, I, I can't even go out there and do it. And so that, to my, in my mind, that was like one of the last, I want to elk hunt, I've been thinking about it, and go, this is kind of another sign. Um, 
actually a few years after I moved up here, my dad got cancer. He's still alive, had surgery and man, it, he pulled through is a, is a rough one, but he, he made it through. So those, you know, kind of life experiences and stuff make me appreciate all those little times in the woods, you know, away from work or whatever you get to, you know, take in all the little simple things and just know how important it is that you're out there, you know, capable of be right at tree line chasing elk and, and doing that stuff and, you know, being able to pull a bow back. And so I think while my body's able and capable to, you know, hike the mountains and shoot a bow, that's, I mean, I'm kind of all in it right now. Um, you know, working out, I go to the gym, and I base my workouts around, you know, packing an elk off a mountain or get my shoulders stable to hold my, hold my bow a little more steady um, to make a more ethical shot. Um, of course, you know, nutrition and diets way better than, you know, what I can do from fast food or going to the grocery store because it's sure. you know it's the best protein in my mind and it's i mean september just passed and i kind of you know i have these things you know texas trip at christmas i can you know go do a white tail hunt or spring turkey but it's kind of back to that okay september's over kind of start prepping for the next year of elk and yeah and seeing you know how can i improve this year i lacked on this or this gear wasn't quite up to par what can i do next year to be more effective or more efficient and just learn. I mean, it took three years for me when I moved up here for the point to where I shot the first elk and hard, long days where, I mean, I would go a week or two sometimes and just be, be so frustrated. Like, man, I've hiked 12 miles today, 15 miles today, every ridge, and I can't find them. I'm putting the work in. And it just took time getting better, you know, kind of learning where there are, where, where they move, where they like to feed, you know, the pressure from other hunters and now I got kind of got to the point where it's like, okay, I kind of got an idea where they're going to be hanging out, kind of how to talk to them better with elk hunting. You can, there's a language that's mm -hmm. very awesome. I mean, cows talk, you can bugle back and forth with the bull to get them, you know, like fired up, like you're another bull trying to come in and take his cows. And just over the years, you know, just being out there and doing it and kind of like the Jordan quote, you know, filled over and over and over again. And that's why I succeed. So there's been times I've done this or not done this, and I was like, man, I, if I would have only just draw my bow and stepped out, I would have been able to get that out. Sure. And, I mean, I love that about archery, um, that it's that much harder. you got to get closer. There's a lot of times you're going to blow a stalk because you're wind or there's a tree in your way or you can't draw your bow back because he's staring right at you versus, and I love all forms of hunting, but rifle where it could be, you know, five to 800 yards out there and you just, you got to make sure you make that shot and, mm. and ethical with the way he's standing. But I think it's, yeah, there's it's everything that's challenging about bow hunting. I mean, there's just so much more work that goes into it. And I think, you know, there, there, there's obviously the, the, you know, the group of, of people like, let's just use like a Cam Haynes or something, mm -hmm. right. That, um, you know, people see that and Cam's constantly training and, um, you know, he says that that's a hundred percent for hunting and, and maybe there's, you know, some validity to that. It could be a hundred thousand percent true, you right, know? Right. Um, but what I think a lot of people don't do is they look at that and go, oh man, this is completely for, you know, vanity reasons. Right. And, um, and maybe there's some of that to it, but the other thing that, that I see is that, you know, that first year, so I did rifle hunt, you know, my whole life. And then, I was, I took a break, a massive break, lost all my points in Colorado. I took, I didn't know you could do that. Like, right. So when you, when you don't, when you, when you put into the draw, for those of you that don't know, put into the draw, if you don't get it, you get points, right? So there's certain areas in Colorado that are, that are like more of a trophy area mm -hmm. or the, you know, the percentage is, you know, of hunters is the allowed is, is far less. So it takes more points. And so you build those and it takes years and years and years to get enough points to be able to actually draw a tag for the opportunity to go hunt that area. And so if you don't put into the draw for 10 years, your points are vacated. They go away. they you know, I didn't realize that. So when I got back into archery, um, a couple of things and I'll get back to, um, huge help from you, um, at the, at the bow shop, got me into it. Um, you know, got a, got a cheaper, uh, PSI. It was a great little bow. I was like, cool. I love this. And it was like, I couldn't quite do some of the things that some of my other buddies that I was shooting with on the weekends could mm -hmm. do. Right. So mm -hmm. then I stepped back into get a better bow, but you know, um, getting back to my point that first year, 
I went and hunted a little bit as a group. We didn't, we weren't successful, had some major failures that I'll absolutely talk about here shortly, but, uh, went back out by myself. Long story short, I hunted that entire one month season, uh, multiple areas. I put 64 miles under my boots. Mm-hmm. Fucking, I lost so much weight. Yeah. I was having to like, literally my belt notches were gone. I was cutting them with <laughs> yeah. a, you know, and people don't realize that it's as much work as it seems, you know, like there, there's so much more work to hunting at let's call it 2300 you know foot elevation in kansas out of a tree stand with a bow right there that there's its own work to that right um and tact but when you're having to put boots on the ground and physically hike and physically stalk a large animal like those Mm -hmm. fuckers are so stealthy you wouldn't think they would be yeah but they are so stealthy and and that put it into perspective how much work and you know the the thing that you always see online is like you know rogan talking to to cam haynes and like rogan was essentially back in the early days like talking shit being like oh whatever man you yeah. know you're just lifting weights for vanity reasons and, and it can't be that much work and then so cam talks to rogan they go hunting and he's like holy shit that about <laughs> yeah. killed me like yeah. it's brutal we're literally hiking miles up a ridge mm-hmm. at eight thousand nine thousand ten thousand feet yeah. i was dead i was done um but th- when he made those statements it shined a completely different light on the archer world because it was like, A, he has a massive following and a massive impact, Mm -hmm. but there was validity to it because Joe was talking shit before that. It was like, it can't be this hard, (laughs) but it's brutal hard. Oh, yeah. Um, And then there's, you'll put that work in and like you're you're seeing them. Like I, I will never forget, it was like four days before the first archery season. So long season, tons of failures. Tons of like, just like, I, I don't even want to be up here anymore. Like, Mm -hmm. this is so much work. It's kicking my ass and to getting on a bull and like, oh my God, my freaking call worked. He's coming in. And that last week or that kind of shoulder period where we're shared with uh, black powder or with muzzleloader season, right? right? Yeah. Like bulls coming in. I'm calling to him. Oh my God, it's actually, this is going to be real. It's going to happen. I got an arrow knocked everything. Boom. Like a muzzleloader shoots the bull. Oh man. And I'm like, oh my God, dude, like how can this even happen? Mm-hmm. You know? And it's like, yeah, it's just one of those things. It's like <laughs> you're, you're the, the highs and lows, like there is no middle ground, mm-hmm. right? It's, it's like, you're either like just so at the bottom, like, man, I, my ass is kicked. I'm depressed. I did everything I thought was right, you know? And then you almost get there and then it's chipped away. Yeah, yeah. Oh, you get winded or whatever, or you succeed, you know? And the thing that was crazy to me when I, so you took your first bull last year, right? First one was actually, I think in 2020. 2020, um, okay. I think is right when COVID was starting that September. I think COVID came around like October or something, but yeah, 2020. And then, I mean, every year since then, I've, I've been able to get one, except for last year, I shot wounded and didn't get him, which was tough. I mean, it was, did all the right things to get there. I actually shot him in the same place I got my bull this year. And that's another thing with bow hunting. It's let the arrow fly and hit him got to be in the bottle sometimes you gotta you gotta wait sometimes 30 minutes to kind of let them go you know let them you don't want to push them and get um all that testosterone and you know get them so stressed out to kind of fix the meat and processing portion of it so this yeah that last year i kind of shot and got nine and a half inches of penetration with the arrow which wasn't bad um but didn't see a lot of blood and it was at night so i kind of backed off and I was like, all right, I'll, I'll let them, it's going to be cool overnight. I'll come back first thing in the morning and search. In my head, I was like, there's a good chance. You know, I saw the way he ran up. I'll be able to find him. And I had four or five guys out there. I mean, I was on my hands and knees for hours. Just, there's a speck. I mean, tiny, as small as a drop use you can find. We were finding every, you know, 20 yards. And just kind of started getting that, like, man, I don't want to wound an animal. I don't want, you know, to get away and, and not be able to harvest it. And so that was the first elk I didn't get. And it definitely, that kind of drove me to do more practicing, more, you know, going through more um, steps, you know, to ethically harvest one. Like uh, scenario-based steps, like different styles of shooting and stuff like that? Yeah, just kind of going through, you know, the basics, I guess, the fundamentals versus, you know, just kind of getting in the moment and drawing, just like, all right, you know, you've been here so many times, draw, get settled in there's an anchor point where you put your your hand for your release and your nose on the string to look through your peep and i kind of just go through a lot of archery shoots and and practicing reps to get to that you know okay been here almost like uh you know 
a, a kicker in the NFL or you know a NBA player free throw. Like if you once you do it so much, it it's you don't think about it anymore. It's it's kind of becomes second nature and comfortable. But I had to kind of go through that instead of I guess rushing through the process and coming through. Everything felt good when I shot, but I can tell my mindset and my process of my. Uh, you know, drawing the bow, getting into my peep sight and, and releasing the arrow was kind of like lost in that moment. Um, it was, you know, really nice bull. And so I kind of, you know, went back to that. All right, you got to drill yourself on these things. Go back, you know, shoot, even if it's at five yards, that paper, but kind of go through those things and get to the point where, you know, you're you're getting into that and thinking about it versus, you know, there there's a bull and drawing and, and kind of shooting and um, so yeah, this year I actually you know, drew back and I thought about all those things. Anchor, get your nose on the string. That's another anchor point mm-hmm. that helps you, it keeps everything consistent. Got on my peep sight and kind of went second time in my head and I said, yep, everything feels good and, and shot. And man, it made it, you know, just the confidence level just went way up from that. And but yeah, I got that bull and about 30 minutes from here, a little bit north and probably the best or top three accomplishments I've ever had in my life. I've done some pretty cool stuff. I mean, I've gone to the top of engineer was pretty cool when I got here. Uh, I think it's like right under 13,000. I haven't done a 14 yet or 14 or, but that, that was pretty cool to eat lunch up there. Um, of course, you know, I've, I've kind of got to higher levels in basketball, which was kind of cool. And, you know, just won awards here and there, but getting that elk, being able to like tune my bow, make my arrows, finding him on public land I, I hunt with people and i hunt if i'm you know can't link up on schedules i'll go by myself and that in particular day i ended up being by myself and it was like two weeks of i didn't hear elk i didn't see elk if i saw a sign it was like it doesn't look very fresh and i was just kind of like you're saying get to the point it's like i i still love bonnie but man i don't you know if i want to wake up early again and you go you know get up at three four in the morning if you're not camped out there at the time I was kind of driving back and forth more than I do now. And so I'd get up and, you know, hike all day and come back at night and go to bed to do it again. And it was awesome. But after two weeks, I was just like drained, like, man, I'm tired. My legs are gassed and sore. And I kind of got on my Onyx app and was like, all right, let's kind of look at this area and see places I haven't, you know, been yet. Where can I, where can I go maybe (laughs) get some elk out of here? And so yeah, I kind of looked up a little game plan the night before and got there in the morning and honestly didn't have, you know, great expectation. I was going to get into elk and didn't pack much food. I had a pack when I first moved up here because I was just getting my gear set up. I actually bought from the Humane Society for like 20 bucks. It was like an 80s Kelty pack. I mean, it, it was like <laughs> weather rotted. Yeah. And I was like, well, I have my, my normal day pack. I can keep whatever in, but if I get something... I'll, you know, come get this one from the truck and then we'll figure it out then. But in my mind, I was like, well, i just see if I see some elk today. And so I kind of started off on the slope, kind of just cruising, looking for a sign and got like two miles in and I saw a rub on a tree, which is, I mean, if if you don't know what that is, a lot of times if you get in the woods, uh, elk will have territories and they'll rub their antlers. Um, it can be for several reasons, but you'll see a bare spot on the tree where they rub and this one I saw was pretty fresh. So I walked over there and kind of sized it up. And I was, it was going upslope for me where I was standing. But when I looked up at the top point of where it was rubbed, I was like, this, that's a big elk because I'm, you know, 6'4". And I'm looking up at this thing. And I was like, that's okay. You think about the elk's head here. And then his antlers are up there. I'm like, all right, well, there might be a bull in here. So I walked for like a minute or two and... Cal called a little bit, just kind of softly and nothing, and walked a little bit more, and Cal called, and I thought I heard something, and just real like a lazy, like like real lackadaisical kind of bugle. So I did like what they call location bugle, just to kind of figure out, okay, was that an elk, and where is he at on this other side of the mountain? And the first bugle I threw out, he he responded, not super amped up or like he wanted to come in running, um, but he did respond. So I was like, well, man, was that a real elk or is that a hunter? <laughs> yeah. Because like you're saying, man, I've run into a lot of times where I call in hunters or, you know, turkey hunting. There's there's so many other people hunting in the woods and 
sometimes you got to play that and you know where's the pressure out okay there's a truck at this trailhead so should i go this way or this way so i was kind of trying to figure that out was that a bugle or is that a hunter waited like two or three minutes and bugled again and and that that time he bugled i kind of in my head i was like i'm pretty sure that's a real bull i couldn't see him yet but i i knew exactly where he's standing on the other side of that that ridge line so i was on one side there's a creek in between us and he was on this other side and so when i did that last bugle i kind of okay that's where he's at this is where i need to get to his level and work with the wind so he doesn't win me and it took me about maybe 20 30 minutes to kind of go navigate through all the thick stuff get over the creek and get up there and the minute i set my pack down i knocked an arrow just i didn't know if he had moved i was like i need to be ready just in case he's you know 30 yards over here in the brush they're huge and like he said you, you'd think they'd you'd be able to see them everywhere but i mean sometimes you'll walk up and kind of looking for an elk or looking for a way to walk and i mean there's an elk standing right there and it's amazing how stealthy they can be so yeah that first bugle i did i can just hear them breaking sticks and coming so i just got you know got my bow ready and yeah it <laughs> I practiced for all these tough shots up and down the hill, 40 yards, 50, 60, and I ended up getting them at like 11, 12 yards, and I can see him walking, coming through the brush, and I just drew my bow back and held where I thought he'd walk, and when he got there, I did a little, I keep a reed in my mouth so I can cow call. And I just did a little cow call for him to stop, stop them, shot, and he ran out to some scree rock probably 20, 30 yards from where I shot him with the arrow, and that point I can see him kind of start you know getting real real woozy and going down and I kind of started getting that you know adrenaline real excited adrenaline rush he ran down a little bit more maybe 20 yards and expired it was quick I mean exactly how you want it to go you know quick and clean you don't want him you know wounded or or injured and so yeah I, I had got him at like eight in the morning and just like you know blown away like this is why I moved up here it happened three years later it was it was, it was amazing that all the you know emotions happy and thankful and everything and then of course that's and then i was like all right i got a couple pictures now i'm by myself now i gotta get this thing off the mountain <laughs> you break them down and, <laughs> that's where the real and, work begins oh and, jesus i've done hogs in texas and, and deer and a lot of times i'll winch them up but this one i it was pretty steep <laughs> and there's a video too i was got myself like pulling on the base of his horns just trying to get him pulled over enough where he wouldn't roll down the hill with this little tree. And as you know, I pulled and pulled. I was like, there's not, there's no way I'm going to even budge this thing at all. I mean, it, I don't know. It's, I'd say six to 800 pound animal yeah. maybe. And so I kind of just got some paracord and just started, you know, going with it. Uh, I think it was, I figured out about eight ten when I made the shot. Um, then I started quartering them out. So I'll do with the elk. You'll have usually like one of the sides, down on the ground, then you got the front and rear legs, you know, facing up on the other side. So the first thing I did was the hide, got that back, and I used that as kind of like a blanket protection from the dirt. Um, took off the front shoulder, the rear leg, the back strap, and then at that point you can kind of roll the elk over, get all the other meat off. Uh, I ended up taking front two legs, shoulders, the rears, back strap, tenderloins, which are inside, and the neck roast. And with all that meat, after I got it hung up in the tree, my first trip down, I think I took, because I had that normal pack on, mm. I took the back straps over my shoulder with my bow and then um, switched packs out, got up there, and I think it was five total trips to get everything off the mound to where my last trip would have been the head and the antlers. I said, well, let's get all the important meat off to the truck. And I got to the truck on that fourth trip, and I kind of sat on the tailgate, and I was like, I... I don't want to go back up there and get those antlers. Like, <laughs> I want to come back in the morning, but I'm right here at a driveway, and this dirt road is, is brutal. I mean, it popped two of my tires one year. It was like, I go all the way home tomorrow and come back. I got to go do this whole drive again. I don't think anyone's going to find the head, but if they do, there's a chance someone could put, maybe take it off the mountain. And I was like, let's just go back up there and get it and be done. And that whole process, <laughs> I threw up a couple times. I didn't have... I mean, anything real solid in my stomach. It was like Nutri-Grain bars and, I don't know, a honey bun or something to start the day. <laughs> so, you know, halfway through the pack out, I was like, my body is shutting down. I'm not physically, like, feeling like this is going well. So, you know, after that elk hunt, the next one, I was like, I, I need to start. I want to train 
to pack an elk off the mountain. This is, this is hard. This hurts. My hips are on fire. Um, I mean, it's still hard, even though I, I, you know, work out and do the weights for it, but it gets easier. I feel like every time you kind of know how to navigate and get down the mountain with that load and, you know, how to kind of get your mindset right. Like, all right, instead of thinking about the whole trip, maybe think, all right, I remember this fence post is about halfway. If I can get to that fence post, get a little shot of water, and then then it's like home free after that. But yeah, one of the greatest feelings. I mean, taking that elk was it tested me in a lot of ways. You know, physically, mentally, you know, skill wise with my bow, it was the full test. The elk. I mean, the mountain alone tests you. The like you said, the the elevation alone. You're you're winding. You're chasing elk, and if you've ever seen an elk kind of get spooked or a herd run, they they cover ground really, really fast. And and crazy stuff too, where you think, oh, there's no way an elk can go up that little rock kind of cliff, and they'll kind of scale it real quick. And got to the point now where I kind of push myself for, all right, that's where they are. Um, it's gonna it's gonna really suck to do this, but if I want to kill an elk, I have to get to that spot. Got to get to him, yeah. Um, yeah, and then I mean, my girlfriend went with me a few times this year and uh, had a great time, was with me when I got that one this year and got to a point where we're going through some elk brush and I'm sitting there bugling back and forth to this elk and I kind of look back and I can tell she's she's having a hard time and I said, do you, you want to go back? You're more important than the elk. You know, your your health is. And she goes, no, I think we can make it. And so we got, you know, maybe five, 500, 600 more feet of elevation, got to this little patch of aspens and it came together there. Um, I was actually trying to call it in for her. I had her set up like 40 yards in front of me. And I said, all right, he's over here. I'm going to try to call him right past you. I'm going to sit behind you. And hopefully he comes right down this trail and you get a shot. And I ended up having a cow come to like seven yards, I think. And I was kind of, it was so thick. I was kind of like trying to see where she was and what activity was over there. And I was like, oh, dude, there's a cow like right there, right by her. <laughs> so kind of just start getting, you know, putting my bill in my hat down, trying to get a little more stealthy. And that bull started getting more and more fired up, whereas like every time I called, he would fire back. And I do this thing to where when they start getting fired up, if they start bugling halfway through their bugle, I'll cut them off, like interrupt them. Mm-hmm. And they do not like that. And at that point, he you can hear him raking, breaking sticks. And I was kind of like trying to find her, like he's, he's coming, get ready. Mm-hmm. Well, he came straight and uh, there was two different paths he can go and he came straight. Instead of turning down that trail where she was, he kind of started going up the mountain and further and further he got. I was like, man, that's not a bad bull. I took the shot and she said she drew back on him, but there's no shot available. But it was just, I mean, the chances you get an archery with a lot of miles and time, there's not very many really good chances to shoot an elk and the ethical, you know, fair, you know, standing broadside where they're not, you know, you're not just slinging an arrow. And this is also public land too. So just for the listeners, I mean, you gotta like some of these, (laughs) let's just call upper echelon hunters, right. That have put in their time and, and get the ability to hunt some of these monster, monster ranches. You know, they're not like high fence ranches. Um, but the, the, the chances of a public land hunt, in Southwest Colorado. Yeah. It it gets (laughs) tough. It gets a little tougher. So, Yeah, there's been a few times turkey hunting, deer hunting. I had a kind of crazy story with the deer one time, like your muzzleloader one. I was up trying to get above tree line deer, just had my spotting scope set up. And it's glassing back and forth, and I found a pretty good one. I was like, well, I'm going to wait for this guy to bed. And it's such a different pace, different game than elk. Uh, elk is, for me at least, I feel like it's, you know, bugle, move. Bu- you're constantly moving walking, trying to get in position. You can tree stand hunt, blind hunt, wallows and stuff like that. But I usually, I'm on, you know, I'm on the go with those. Whereas deer, it's kind of, you find them, you wait till they bed and it's like a cat and mouse, real slow pace, you know, you know, just being patient, wait for it to be bed in the right position and making a game plan to get to them. And uh, so, yeah, I had my spotting scope on this deer on the other side of the mountain. I was like, well, I'm going to see, wait for him in the bed, and then I'm going to try and put a little stock on him and see if I can make that happen. But it, it was early in the morning, maybe an hour or two before he'd actually kind of go and start getting ready to bed while he's feeding early morning. And so I was like, well, I'm going to get my binos out and glass this whole mountainside for another deer. 
So I'm glassing. There's a few little forkies and smaller deer that I'm not really interested in. But during that glassing session, I hear a big boom, like a you know rifle shot. And this is archery season, and I'm new to Colorado. Texas is so much different, too, with the hunting regulations and laws. In my mind, I'm like, is that a bear tag or is that poaching? Like, I don't think you can rifle hunt right now. And then I went, man, I wonder if that deer heard that because that gunshot sounded like it was up by that deer I had my spotting scope on. So I got back in my spotter, and that deer that I was glassing was actually shot with the one they shot. Oh, and so I w- shit. Yeah, I waited about 10 minutes, and I was like, oh. dang, that's crazy. And yeah, two guys went up there and started cleaning them up. And so I was like, man, I, you know, it was kind of neat to see in a way, like, oh, that's cool to see, like they got it and they're cleaning it from this perspective. But, you know, it was like two or three hours of making this plan and the strategy. And it was like, well, now I go to this ridge mm-hmm. or do I go, you know, to the bottom of the unit and um, it can change so quick uh, with anything in public land is, I mean, very possible to get a nice bull or a bull, but the pressure versus like a trophy unit, the one you have to build points is is completely different. I have never got to hunt a trophy unit, but I have helped a few buddies pack out bulls. And um, I mean, I walked in there, I left at like two in the morning. So I got there like right when the light, you know, was coming up and started hiking into where that bull was. And it felt like without me even calling for him, every little hillside had a bull, you know, acting like an elk, a little mm. bit more vocal. And that is you know, tight lip because there's pressure around or this or that. So that was kind of neat to experience. Even to where the, we were standing by my buddy Clayson, mm-hmm. was standing by his tent and, uh, I mean, had the meat and everything. And I'm like, let's, let's call a bull in right here. Just see if we can do it. And had this little like raghorn run up to like 30 yards, kind of trying to see where we were. And then he finally caught our wind and ran off. But it was just, it's kind of neat. Like, man, they, they're acting like the TV shows I remember yeah. in Texas. This is this <laughs> yeah. is what I remember. This is what you see on yeah. the highlight reels. Yeah. Oh man. Yeah. The public land thing is is kind of crazy. We uh, so that that first hunt that I was saying we had all these just just disaster, right? We uh, so I drew. Um, I think we went up with three three guys. So it was myself, Jared, and another buddy of us, Brian. Mm-hmm. And so we went up there. We all uh, oddly enough drew uh, uh, drew a buck tag, right? And I, I don't necessarily know that, I mean, it, hunting deer is so hard. For one, during archery, they're, they're not rutting, right? So they're just chilling. Mm-hmm. They're stone cold chilling, and they can see you from a mile off. Oh, and, can, yeah. and it's it's a motherfucker to hunt. It's super, super hard. So hard. And so we went, uh, we hiked nine miles in, right? We're like, we got the spot. We went up there three weeks before uh, season. Um, I mean, we were we were in them. Like, we were, they were thick. with. We all also had over-the-counter elk tags. So we saw elk. <laughs> we saw deer and we get up there, right? Still not enough rain. So it's kind of, it's pretty dry. It's crinkly. They pushed out a little bit, but we had planned to hunt there. So we're like, going to we get up there. And, uh, so that, that night before opening day, we kind of go out and like hike up another mile and we're like looking out of this ridge. And it's just when people are starting to put on, like start their fires. And we counted 12 in like, uh, from the top of the ridge, like, oh <laughs> yeah. man. And these are all the six, seven, eight, maybe a thousand maybe 2,000 yards apart of each other. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, my oh. God, there's so many people yeah. up here, man. <laughs> and then we're, we were back at camp, and all of a sudden other hunters are walking back down to the trailhead. Oh, yeah. Dude, it's you're nine miles to the trailhead. What are you doing? Like, i got to go back to the truck. I'm like, what? <laughs> you know, and then I'm like, where are you from? Oh, we're from Texas, or where are you from? Oh, we're from Wyoming. Mm-hmm. And it was just brutal, man. And so we, we're up there hunting. We go out opening morning. <clears throat> we all just decided that morning to kind of go our own separate ways. Um, I probably should have taken it, came across a smaller buck, smaller doe. Um, didn't take shots opening morning. We're good to go. Right. Trying to make, you know, make, make use of this, what was supposed to have been a six day hunt. <laughs> yeah. And, and we backpacked and brought everything in. Right. So it's a little bit different. And so then like that morning I could kind of already start to see some clouds rolling. I'm like, all right, it's about to get nasty. Put the rain gear on, kind of start a mid morning sort of hike back. Right. Maybe two miles from camp. Um, so we start going back up there. Uh, I get back to camp. Every one of us is completely soaked. So we decide, uh, we went back out and hunted that night by ourselves. Everybody you just came up dust, nothing. So the next morning we, we developed, like, we're going to go up on the ridge, we're going to glass, and then we're going to drop in. So we get up there the next morning, and it's like perfect situation, you know, calm after the storm. Everything mm-hmm. is quiet. Everything's a little bit wet, right? So we're a little quieter. Yeah. We glass, see two monster bucks. Jared, 
is like, okay, I'm going to drop in. I'm going to swing far to the left. What I'm going to do is I'm going to push them back. And there's this, what I call monkey brush. It's not scrub oak, but like up in the high country, it's super thick, super dense. The deer are just like packed in there. Yeah. But when you get in there, it's like a maze. You don't know which way's yeah. up. And yeah. you're like, I, where? and he's like looking back at me through his binoculars. And I'm like, like signaling him, like, I can see you. You got to go. And he's like, where, how far? I'm like 10 feet, 10 yeah. feet that yeah. way, yeah. you know? And it's crazy. So, and at some point, um, I signaled to him and I let him know I'm going to drop down to the right. And I'm actually going to put, if you push them down, you'll push them into me. And so, man, I get down there and I'm not lost, but like, there's no more communication. And I look back up at the ridge. Brian's gone. I don't know where the fuck Brian <laughs> went. He's gone. So we're three hunters in a party and we're all completely separated. We have no visibility of each other. Really, maybe we're 2000 yards apart from each other. And so I wait there mid morning, find a cool Creek, um, clean some water, um, and just kind of chilled. It was a great morning. And I was like, okay, hunt's pretty much over. So I start to walk back. I get back to camp. <clears throat> uh, Brian had left, like something had happened. He's like, I got to go. I'm like, all right, that works. That's, that's kind of weird. And then, you know, I get back to camp and I'm like, all right, well, Jared must've stayed out there. I don't know what's going on. So it starts to get later in the afternoon. So I'm like, well, I'm going to go back where I saw those does that first opening morning. And so I hiked two miles in. And I come all the way back after that night, get back to camp. No Jared, no Brian. And I'm like, what the hell is going on, dude? Like, this is really, really crazy. Like, really weird. Yeah. So I kind of start to get that. Like, I'm just going to make some dinner, make enough for everybody. I'm sitting there. And I'm like, all right, man. Like, it's dark enough, man. Like, they should be back at camp. What's yeah. going on? Yeah. So <clears throat> I start to get a little bit like, you know what? It was like slick rock getting down into that monkey brush, like Jared could have hurt himself. Yeah. I never saw him. I never made contact with him. Hold tight, man. So I hike in. It's, it's almost a mile up to the top of the ridge. I got just enough light at the ridge to start glassing. And then I see nothing. I'm flashing my light. Like if you see me, right. And, and he also had a, he had a blanket. We were all like carrying a blanket just in case something happened to cover yourself up. But I was like, okay, well maybe I'll get a reflection off of this and he'll be able to, or I'll be able to find him. Right. Dude. And I'm, I'm like, then the panic starts to ensue and I'm like, holy shit. Okay. What if he's, what if he's down there? What do I do? Like, what do I actually do? And I'm like, I start to like really, really think about this and I start calling for him. Jared, you know, just cause I mean, it's echo to mm -hmm. like, you can hear it off the Canyon walls. Like it, if, if he can respond back to me, the guaranteed he can. And I start no, no, like maybe five, six, 10, 12, 15 times a okay. call. And I'm like, okay, he's, he's either real hurt and he's not there. So I'm like, let me just go back to camp one more time. Maybe he did the same thing with me and came back later. Maybe sure. he went. So I get back to camp, still nothing. No, Jared. I've got my, <clears throat> I've got my spot, right? But it's, it's, a, it's basically a SAT communication. So it's spotty at best, mm -hmm. depending on the time. And I've sent a couple of texts out uh, through this device. And I'm like, they're getting, they're kind of like getting ready to send in there. You know, so I need to take that up to the very top. And so... I start to fucking like really panic at this point. I was like, I think he's hurt. Mm -hmm. And so anyways, as a hunter, when you buy um, a fishing license, right, you get, you, you have the ability, you pay a dollar or whatever that goes into the, so search and rescue. If you hit this right. button, if you hit the SOS button, yep. they're coming to you. Yep. Um, but if somebody's not hurt, it's a huge fee, yeah. like astronomical <laughs> yeah. fee that you are responsible for. And so I hike all the way back up to the top. And at this point I am, I'm a thousand percent sure Jared is fucked up. I'm a th like, I've got myself convinced. So I, I empty everything out of my pack. I throw in there two heat blankets or two, two, um, uh, what are those blankets called? Like the thermal, thermal blanket, yep. two thermal blankets, some food, some extra water. And, um, and, uh, I had like a, I had a first aid pack that I normally take with me while I'm hunting cause it can compress. And then yep. I had another one that was bigger. That's all I had with me. And I'm sprinting, sprinting up to the top of the ridge at this point. Um, I get up there and I pull out my sat dude and I am about to hit the fucking SOS button and bing, a message comes through and I'm like, what the fuck is this? But it's from my wife. So I can, you can save people in there, you know, and I've got like three numbers. So yeah. Jared, Brian, my wife, right? So yeah. if we have to get lost, we can communicate with each other. And I get this message and it's, I'm like, what the fuck? It's from my, aunt. this is so strange. And it's Jared, this is Kyle or Kyle, this is Jared. I'm at your house. And I'm like, at my house. I'm like, what are you talking about, babe? And she's like, and then he responds again. So something in the mix had gotten lost. So Jared's responding to me, but I had been texting my wife being like, 
Have you heard from Jared? Sure. Yeah. And so he freaks out because she calls him while they're back in town with reception. Oh, man. Hey, I think Kyle's hurt. Yeah. <laughs> Dang. And then so, but she had no idea that Jared had gone back into town, no. right? Yeah. <laughs> Miles in the woods by myself. And so he goes over there, finally figure out he's okay. He just fucking left because he had had three days of getting poured rained on. It was it was brutal. Like yeah. we, we were sopping wet the whole time. And so then I'm like, oh, dude, fuck this. <laughs> and so I get back. And what he had done, he tells me this later. There were, we, we got there and there were two trekking poles at camp, right? It had been used by somebody else. So we were using them all weekend to dry shit. He put them in front of his tent door crossed. I'm like, dude, these trek, we had, we had been like playing like late night, you know, drinking some whiskey, yeah. like playing swords with these <laughs> ski poles. Like, I didn't even know, yeah. like they, I didn't, you know, think about it. Oh my Lord. <laughs> and so, yeah, I get up the next morning, I go hunting and I'm in the middle and I'm still just so like frantic. I didn't sleep that night. And I'm like, dude, just fuck this. Man. <laughs> yeah. I'm out of here. Yeah. I'm out of here. So oh, I'm breaking man. down my, I go back, I break down camp and, uh, yeah. And then, so I'm, I'm driving out and I pass Jared and his, and his, uh, at the time, his ex-wife. And so, um, but uh, yeah, I'm like, dude, what the fuck? And he, he's just like, I didn't, I didn't think anything of it, man. I was like, bro, I thought you were dead. I like a hundred thousand percent thought oh, you were dead on feeling, the mountain. Too. That feeling too. <laughs> yeah. That, that panic. Like, yeah. <sighs> and then, so what the funny thing was, was in case when I, when I left to go to the Ridge, I was like, worst case scenario, if I get lost, if I get hurt trying to find him, I want to leave somebody a note. So I took charcoal out of the campfire. I wrote on this gigantic uh, tree that was up there. It was white bark. So I wrote a, a message and then I took a map and I drove a fucking pen through it. Mm -hmm. So it was like, this is where I'm going. And I wrote on there, like, this is where I'm going. Like, this is where I'll be if I get hurt. Yeah. Jared sees that. Cause I, I, I was so frantic. I just left it there. He's like, dude, that was brilliant. Yeah. I was like, <laughs> yeah. Bro, like, yeah, like you, you, he's like, man, you have given me like the worst anxiety I've ever had. In yeah, my life um, from this. I've had a few of those hunting and like shed hunting, just trying to, you know, get back with your group or whatever, and then you lose service, and it's like, man, I know how to get back, but where'd they go? And you don't want to go too far. If, like you said, they get hurt. It's like, man, I don't want to go back to the truck, and then it gets dark, and then they're out there, and then no service. So you're kind of doing these circles, or you know, hollering and. My brother, uh, he's a pilot, and he did um, air med for a while. And he always told me when I was out here, like, wherever you go, just tell someone before you go, because I do a lot of solo hunts, especially when I was at Goods. I'd have, I'd have like, a Tuesday or Thursday, and then that Sunday at, we were closed, so um, I wouldn't get back-to-back -back days. I wouldn't get, you know, as much vacation to hunt at that time. So, you know, I was always like, all right, this day I'm going to go try this spot and then go over here. And so I'd always, you know, whoever it was, I'd be like, this is the area I'm going to be in. If I'm not, if I, if you don't get a text by midnight, something's wrong. Cause I plan to be out by that time. Um, nothing's nothing. I've never been in any kind of scenario where anybody I've been with or, you know, myself has been hurt, but it's, it's definitely crossed my mind, you know, going over some like rocks and you know, get close to like the rock slips and you like, Ooh man, that could have been bad real quick falling down that and mm -hmm. twisting an ankle and then three miles up here. And I got to get down this mountain with, you know, a sprained or broken ankle. And so that, that dollar or whatever it is for that, uh, man, I can't remember, the Habitat stamp or something. Yeah, it's a Habitat search stamp, and but rescue. Yes, it works for the search and rescue. So worth it if it's if something's really happened because they'll, you know, they'll fly out there and get and mm. get you out. And I mean, I thought about that this past weekend. I went on a rifle hunt with Clayson and um, coming down the mountain. And I, I think one of them mentioned it, but I was like, if you were to get hurt up here, however, you know, fall and get stabbed, cut, break your leg, whatever, it's hard enough to get down with you know two good legs and then with one or whatever it's 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 a it's a it's a lot to take in when you get on the mountain hunting any kind of critter uh it's yeah <laughs> it can get it can get pretty airy pretty quick if you're not careful and kind of you know, put stuff together and well that preparedness man that's what so what's easy for you know myself included i mean i was i was working out but nowhere near like what I see you doing now or like a Cam Haynes or like Dan, I forget Dan's. Stanton, uh, I think. Dan Stanton. Like, I mean, yeah. those guys get after it to prepare, but I was worked out enough to basically make the hike into camp and hunt. Yeah. I didn't think, like you think, oh, we're going to go nine miles. We got the spot nine miles in. It's nine miles up and then you're in there. It's like, it's, you, you have to be able to be prepared enough if you're going to backpack hunt uh -huh. to pack in your gear, yep. right? hunt that whole entire time, pack mm -hmm. out an elk and then mm -hmm. go back in and pack out, oh. you know, and it's, it's yeah. brutal. And like, I don't, it's easy to see, 
you know, like, uh, what is that group, man? Um, and it's so obviously, you know, you got the hush guys and they always kind of hunt as a group sometimes. I mean, Eric goes out and does his own thing, but, um, a lot of times they got a group, right? So they can help each other and you call friends, Hey, we got a pack out. And a lot of people do that. Most people that are in the hunting community are so, yeah, I'll meet you. Where am I going? Mm -hmm. Like, let's, let's help you pack this animal out. Um, but like, if, if you're not by your, you know, not with a group and you're by yourself or you're, you know, you're back there and like freaking bivy hunting and it's like, you got to be in enough kind of a shape to, Mm -hmm. to make sure that if you get hurt, if you just even carry your shit in and carry yourself, yeah. cause like, yeah. let's say you camp for three days, you could, I mean, you could easily put 25 miles on, yeah. like you're basically hiking a marathon, yeah. right? And yeah. then you're usually hiking with a bow in your hand with water on oh, your hips. Yeah. Cause you're going to be out for a few hours or maybe the whole day you got a pack on that's not full, but it's got stuff in it. So you're not just hiking with you in a pair of shorts and a set of Nikes. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so that's what I think people, you know, they watch these videos on YouTube that are heavily curated and then they think that they can do that themselves. And there's a good chance that you can't. I mean, wherever you want to draw from for your inspiration, right. but just be realistic about it. I mean, there's a lot it's, of work that goes into so it. Um, and so I think, unfortunately, it's probably affecting a lot of people that, like that guy that was humping down, I got to go back to the fucking truck. He was from Texas. I was like, oh, you are flatlander, bro. You, <laughs> yeah. And we were up near Dollar Lake. You uh-huh. know, just whatever. That's 10,000 yeah. feet. Yeah. You know, it's like I'm next to where the tree lines stop. Uh-huh. And I mean, dude, just the altitude for altitude oh, sickness. It's, and it's, and it, too, like, I mean, you get, sometimes you got to go to those spots that's like no one wants to go to. They're thick and nasty. You're getting scratched or they're so steep up or down. It's like, there was a canyon this year, two days before season ended. There was a bull down there, way, I mean, so steep and so deep. And going down there with my girlfriend, I kind of was like, do you want to go shoot that one? She goes, I, I want to kill it. So I was like, all right. And then I went maybe 100 yards into the hike, and I, I was like, either way, once we get to the bottom, it's going to be hard coming out with with the elk or not. But if we get an elk, it's going to be hard. And it was, it was super tough. We got into them, didn't pack anything out that night, but it was it was. I mean, she learned a lot from it, and um, it was just, it was a neat kind of cool, you know, see a new elk's, you know, bedroom kind of thing. You get down to where they live, and then you just start seeing sign or rubs and beds. And, and yeah, the work, though, is, I mean, like you're saying, you get in nine miles and you shoot something, that's where, like, most of the work begins, too. I mean, you put a lot of work in. So you got 30, 40 pounds in your pack with your tent and your sleeping bag and food and water and all this stuff for three, four days. You get that and get it set up and then hunting, you, like you said, you got to get that out. You got to get the animal out. I, I forget how the law states it, but you're supposed to take a certain percentage of the animal out with you when you harvest it. And I think it kind of consists of the amount of like the front legs, the rear legs and back strap or something. And um, you're not required to take the ribs, but I mean, if you wanted all to utilize everything, the necros, the ribs, tenderloins, back strap. That's it's quite a bit of meat and weight and and you know, and like you said, I <laughs> I tell everyone I take all my vacation now for hunting season pretty much unless something comes up you know, two, three weeks at a time. And, you know, before I leave work, I'm I'm like it's like a a bear going into winter. It's like I gotta get all these calories in because September hits and I'm gonna lose fifteen pounds just because I'm hiking every day really hard and I'm eating, you know, freeze dried peak refuels or whatever, you know, the mills that aren't super heavy, like I'm normally eating when I get home from work or something. So, you know, I get you know, 20, 30 pounds working out throughout the summer, spring, summer, getting ready for this and September hits doing well. And then, you know, September ends and it's like, I got to put that weight and shrink back <laughs> yeah. on. I just lost it in a month. And and kind of the elk kind of do the same thing when they go through the rut. They get, you know, bigger, but through that rut, you know, they're they're running around, you know, trying to get cows or, you know, find other bulls, and they lose a lot of that, that weight, you know, going in the winter. So a lot of times, you know, depending on the bull's hierarchy and stuff and their weight, you know, that going into the winter and the rut, it can put a hernia on them, you know, as far as trying to, you know, get their bodies that weight through the winter time so the winter doesn't kill him. You know, cold weather, you know, feed. And um, Clayson's bull, he actually just shot. It was a good one to take. Got it with the rifle. He got up to it that next morning, shot it at night, got to it the next morning, and its front, I believe its left leg, had been broken, and the, the bone was actually sticking out of the hide. I don't know how long it had been like that. For at least a week or two, you could tell. It was all swollen, mm. uh, starting to get like a little infection. 
But that bull, I mean, if that bull would have got shot, shot during rifle season and then gone to winter with that brutal, just that cold, the cold temps and trying to eat and it might not have made it. And then, uh, you know, something would have taken care of it, probably coyotes, mm-hmm. bear or something if they're still out at that point. But that was a good one to harvest for Clayson because it was like, all right, this bull is hurt or on the downhill. Um, and he might not make it through winter. So it was, it was good, good take. And now his family's got meat through the winter. And, um, I mean, it's just every time I see an elk get processed or get an ice chest back, this was the first year me and my girlfriend actually did everything through the meat grinder and mixed a little fat in and packaged it and which put another whole level of work into the process. <laughs> Cause usually it's like, all right, I got the four legs back shop. It's they're in ice chest. I take it to a processor $400 later that they, they have it packaged up. I go pick it up and it's over where this year, you know, I, I shot the elk on a Sunday, had to work on Monday. So I stayed up to like two, three in the morning after work. First night, I was just kind of cutting chunks, getting the meat off the bone. And then it was grinding and then, then mixing fat and packaging. And that was like two or three nights of, you know, full day's work from after work to another work shift to back to normal day. And in between that, I had a bear tag. And in Colorado, you can't bait bears, but you can hunt over a carcass. So in my mind, I've never shot a bear. I've seen a couple. I had an opportunity to shoot one, but I was like, hey, it looks a little young. I'd rather shoot something more mature. But in my mind, I was like, well, here's elk carcass and this perfect opportunity to go back up there and maybe fill a bear tag. So that Monday, or, so yeah, it was Monday. So I I think it was like two hours of light from 5 o'clock till 7 when it started getting kind of like legal shooting light. Get off work get there as fast as I could without speeding and, you know, driving on like all crazy to get to the mountain, basically sprint up the mountain to sit on the carcass until it's dark. The very first night I got there, there was a bear, but it was so dark and thick. I was kind of like, man, where, where is that carcass at? And right when I kind of figured out kind of the area it was, a big black bear kind of turned and looked at me and then didn't run, but just kind of walked over this little hill where we cleaned the elk at. So I just sat there until dark with an arrow, like, all right, it didn't run. It wasn't spooked. Maybe it was just like, I heard something, I'll, but there's a carcass with meat, so good chance it could come back. And every day after work, I do that same thing. Never saw it again, but I go get off work at five, get there at six, hunt for an hour. You know, whatever time I had left in the day, to, this is the best chance I have seen a bear. And I mean, every time I got there, you could, you could see the carcass move, so I'd it back up before I left, put the height over it so you'd have to kind of work. And finally to a point, you know, where he picked, it was so clean picked. I was like, well, <laughs> and that was the week it stormed. I was so tired from packing the elk out, going to work, clean the elk. One day I was hiking up and there was such a bad thunder lightning storm. I mean, it was so bad. I got halfway up to that bear and I was like, I don't know if I should be going up this mountain right now. This is dangerous, like dangerous storm. I was halfway up and I was like, this, he's, he could be there and this is my chance. So I got to keep pushing. I got to go. It's not very smart. I, I shouldn't be on the mountain with this lightning storm. But I got up there, kind of made like a little, I put all my rain, my pack on my cover, my rain cover, uh, put my rain gear on to where I was so tired at that point. I think it was Wednesday after I shot the elk, I was standing just with my head down just trying to stay dry at that point, about 30 yards. And every five minutes, I kind of look up at the carcass just to see if the bear came in. It's hammering rain. It's clapping thunder and lightning all around me. And I'm, I literally doze off standing up and I had to like catch myself on a tree from, you know, cleaning the meat. And I was like, man, I'm pretty tired. If I'm falling asleep, there's a bear that's, you know, around this carcass and it's thundering. Those are two kind of dangerous situations I can get myself in, you know, a bear that's guarding a carcass. And I was like, one more day I need to get, I need, I, I think I need to take one day and kind of catch up on sleep, but it's, yeah, that, that cleaning process. I mean, it, it gave me a whole new level of respect and, um, you know, packaging it, mixing it. And it's, it's, it's super time consuming, but now that, you know, I've done that and it's packaged. I mean, I feel like every bite, every meal, it's like, I know how much work went into this, you know, 
ethically taken on public land. This is it's like every bite seems so <laughs> satisfactory every time. It's like this is this is good stuff. So that's that's a huge driving factor. Well, one of the things you said too is, um, you know, I've had buddies do this where you just have a you have a bust year, right? It just it happens. Mm-hmm. Um, your buddies, you know, they have a successful year, and you know, hey man, come over grab some meat, mm-hmm. you know, or hey, you know, I I got a I got a deer, and my son also got a deer, you know. And they've got a family of five to feed and sure they're going to eat most of it, but Hey, take a few steaks or this. Yeah. And, you know, you kind of, there's, there's a weird level of, you know, within the hunting community, I don't live in it as, as much as you do, but I'm obviously aware of it, but it's, it's a weird level of community. And then also like camaraderie, mm-hmm. you know, especially, you know, like the, the, the only other time I think I really because it's like rifle hunting is, is one thing, but my experience with rifle hunting was a little bit different. It was always like hunting with your dad or something. I never, I never really got to rifle hunt with, with like my friends when right. we were all, it was like, but the other like super uh, camaraderie based type hunting was duck hunting. Like that was the hunting that I love so much because like you were literally like hanging out with the boys yeah, yeah. and you were shooting and you were having a good time. And, um, but like archery is akin to that in a sense, because it's, it's very, it's, it's, it's a thing that you can sit there and do with your friends. And then there's always like that competition level of, you know, like this underlying thing, like, well, even if we're just target shooting, right. Like we're, um, we're shooting at a hundred yards, which is ridiculous. We're shooting <laughs> yeah. at 150, you know? Um, but it's like, you're, you're po- constantly pushing each other, but you're also pulling from each other. Like, it's like this give and take it's, Hey, let me learn how to do this. Or, Hey, how would you do this? Totally. And that was one of the things I saw you know, first when I, you know, having no experience with a bow, you know, and I walk in and, and, you know, Eric's my neighbor, but Eric's also intimidating, right? <laughs> if you, if you know nothing about <laughs> archery and you walk in, like Eric, it can be very, very intimidating because he knows everything about it. Right. And so when you go in as a complete novice, you know, and that's why I was so thankful. It's like when I came in and I had my Hoyt, it was like, Hey, I, I got this bow, but I don't know what the fuck I'm doing. Christian, you were like, okay, well, let's look at this. This is your draw. This is your height. This is what you bought. And it's like, you took that time. Um, obviously now knowing because of the love of archery, like it's like you get something good out of teaching somebody else, this thing that you're passionate about. Yeah, yeah. Cause then there's a potential that you can share in that passion with another person. Right. And so you're building this community, but it's like, um, I, I felt that more with the archery than I ever did with rifle hunting. Um, but I, I think mine's not tainted, but it's just a little bit skewed because I didn't have <clears throat> the experience of doing that yet with my buddies. I wasn't that old. Right. Sure, yeah. And so, but with archery, it's, it's way more community based than I thought. And then once I got into it, um, and, and it's something that's, it's kind of intriguing from the outside world to look at, yeah. you know, it's, it, I think almost more so than, than other types of hunting, you know, like if you. You know, you can watch an old school video of somebody whitetail hunting with a rifle. It's kind of boring. <laughs> I mean, there's, there's, you know, but you watch a, a hunting video where there's, you know, a group of guys and they're like, they're in on these elk and they get into them and they, man, they fail, they fail tonight, but then they go out the next morning and just to watch the sheer joy of somebody experiencing that, yeah, it's like, good. it's, it's, it's like, it's infectious. Mm-hmm. Like you want to do it. You want to be a part of that moment. Yep. Um, but it's, it's, it's goes back to that, that archery is community kind of thing. And I see that with, with you guys and like doing these 3d hunts mm-hmm. and, um, you know, it's like crazy. Like I, I remember like, like, um, so like, I, you know, for those of you guys that don't know what, what a 3d hunt or a 3d tournament is, or, you know, basically set up a ton of like 3d targets, a lot of them have to, you know, take place on, on ski hills where, you know, people ride up the lifts. And anyway, so it's, it's a two or three day event. Um, they're a ton of fun, right? You, you shoot an astronomical yeah. and you lose a ton of arrows, oh, but, yeah. you, but you, you know, what's crazy is like, I remember, um, so Jared, huge Dudley fan, massive Dudley yeah. fan, right? Fucking fanboy to the nine <laughs> loves yeah. him. Uh, but that's good because you know, D- Dudley believes in archery, builds a community, gives back into it. And he's amazing. Um, but I, I remember, I can't remember what event you're at, but like you put up a picture and like you're sitting there like shaking hands with Dudley and like you guys are like, hey man, we're at the same event. I was like, that's how crazy it is. When you can have John Dudley, right? For those of you that don't, just look him up. I don't want to give his, I don't want to botch his background, but the guy, the guy is probably one of the most well-known people to build back into the archery community, mm-hmm. right? Yep. An amazing person. Awesome. And you're sitting there shaking hands with him. And I'm like, holy shit, Christian's up here like with Dudley 
and they're at the same exact tournament. They're shooting the same targets. And then like the next year, I hear Dudley over your shoulder while you're shooting like yeah. 110 <laughs> like across the pond. And I'm like, dude, this community is insane. It's it's awesome. it's, it's a really it, it. I think it's it's unlike anything that I've ever seen or experienced, man. It's it, it's pretty it's pretty interesting for sure. Yeah, and one of the things too, I uh, the 3D. Uh, they have competition levels and just to do it for fun. I kind of do it going into it. There's uh, the Toll Archery Challenge. There's Mountain Archery Fest, which is here local with Brandon. Um, but yeah, they have several different courses from beginner, intermediate to, you know, just extreme 100 plus yard shots. Or There's one we did at 126. And I do that, one, to have fun, that community. I mean, I've met people all over the United States from those that, you know, I've, I still am in touch with or friends with. And, you know, the next year I'll go to a different location in Utah or Montana and there's those people again. And it's just the faces you see and everyone's kind of living that same lifestyle of, you know, that, you know, going out, harvesting something, eating and giving back to that community. And like you said too, like most of the people that are in it, if, if you get a bull down, you can call people on, they'll come help or, you know, other people will come and help with their pack out. And it's such a, like kind of like a, a smaller community, but it's real tight. Even, even through, you know, distance and stuff, there's a lot of connection. Um, and that hint too, Dudley, the first time I ever met him was at a toll archery in park city. And, uh, actually one of the things I told Eric when I started at goods, he's like, well, have you worked in a shop? What do you know about archery? And I said, well, I, I tinker with my bows at the house. I don't have a bow press. I've never worked in a shop, but I watch a lot of John Dudley videos. He has a YouTube channel, and um, I think he does like a school of knock, where he'll teach you how to hold the bow, how to release. I mean, pretty much anything you need to know, and he explains it very simple, you know, to someone that's new to it, very thorough, um, super down-to-earth guy. He's fun, and, you know, people watch these things, get a bow, watch his videos, and then they show up to the shoot, and he's cheering you on, and that gets people excited. He's getting little kids, you know, the, the youth are shooting hundred yard shots and he can, he's done it so much. He can kind of tell you, he did it for my girlfriend, like, all right, what's your furthest pin? You can shoot 60 yards. That targets a hundred yards, put this pin on this tree limb and it should fall in pretty close. And he's pretty good at it. So he'll get these, you know, 12 year olds launching an arrow at, you know, like they're shooting at the sky and hitting this big foot target a hundred yards. And it's just, it lights up their whole day. Um, yeah. And that, I mean, Taking stuff from friends, Delhi, whatever it is, through community, talking stories. I mean, I don't think I'll ever figure out an elk 100% or a deer, but you kind of listen to stories or go on a hunt or make a mistake and, and you, you kind of learn from other people you've hunted with. And okay, that worked pretty good for them. Let me try that. And I mean, from the, I don't know, I've been here five or six years now in Colorado. And from the first time I hunted with Byron, that was a uh, bow tech over in Cortez. Um, I think that was the first bull I saw, like hunting wise, and that just off the side of the road. We went up, he was calling for me, and I saw that thing going back and forth. And I'm so used to the white tail in Texas. If you make a movement or go to retrieve range finder or do anything, you see their tail and they're gone. I mean, you, you have to be so still, your sound, everything, everything clothing wise is real like fleecy. So, mm -hmm. I mean, all this noise is, is kind of taken out of the equation. So when I got to here first to Colorado, there's an elk and I was like froze, like, oh man, I can't move. And then he would kind of put his head down and I'd try to like sneak to this other tree to get a shot. And then he'd move finally to where he kind of lost interest of like, well, I don't see a cow. Byron was trying to be like a cow behind me to pull him past me. Like, well, I don't see a cow. So I guess I'm just going to kind of go back over here or go to bed or whatever. And I kind of looked at Byron. I kind of knew at that point the hunt's over. I, I don't know what I did wrong with hunts over. And I looked up and I'm like, man, what did I do? Once we got met up, he's like, hey, you could have probably just been a little more aggressive. You're mm -hmm. like too stealthy. And then he started telling me, man, my, my dad and I went hunting. He would throw rocks in the wallows or get, you know, branches and rub them against trees and make noise. And, you know, so the next year I was like, well, I remember him saying, you know, throw a rock in the swallow or do this and break a branch. And, man, they responded. I was like, dude, it's working. Yeah. And so like this year to the point where I'm like bugling to an elk with a stick, raking a tree hard, making this noise. And, you know, they're like, they're curious to the point like, oh, what's this bull doing or what's this cow? And I mean, it's, that's one thing too with bow hunting is like, I mean, 
I love elk hunting. I love all different kinds, but there's so many different species that take you different places, different styles of hunt. Deer hunts, it's slower hunt than a elk hunt. A pronghorn is, you know, they're out in the badlands and plains and you, they see so good. And with the bow, it's like just to get in bow range with that thing is almost a successful hunt at mm-hmm. that point. And then to get a shot off, it's, and I think all those different, you know, the locations trying to learn the animal, its language, where its tendency to go feed or be, and, and that's it drives me because it's like it's a never-ending work, uh, work ethic kind of goal I got to meet. And, well, it's, and it's a kind of like a literal, you know, changing landscape too. Yeah, <laughs> you know, it's it's, oh, it's constantly moving. It's you know, and the 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 other thing too that I I didn't realize it was so much with um, I mean you're always. I I guess you're always cognizant of it, right? Like when the wind, but you don't, it's insane how fast it can shift. And then it's insane how fast you can watch a gigantic animal, 700 pound bull wind you and go Mm -hmm. like without fail done. And you're like, Oh, all right. Well, I didn't even, I didn't feel it. And you hear some of these like really seasoned hunters be like, I felt the wind hit my neck and I knew it was over. And you're like, I wasn't even thinking about that. I was focused on this giant animal and, yeah. and it's like all these little tiny baby microscopic nuances that you're so like, many little things. man, I got to think about this to get, you know, to get close uh, enough. Uh, and that that's for me, the takeaway with archery is like, and a lot of people, you know, it's, it's not for them. It's not for everybody, but it, it does not, not to downplay uh, rifle hunting. Right. But when you have the ability to be 400 yards away, you, 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 you don't have to be as stealthy, right? Mm-hmm. And you also don't have to worry about some of these things. You still have to, you know, you have to be a hunter. You can't be right. out there just like with your boom box doing your thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. But, um, but you, you gotta be so much, I mean, most eth- ethical shots, like I, a lot of guys, you don't hear like, yeah, I'll practice at 125, but I'm not, I'm not taking a shot past 60. Yep. Like 60 is a long it's, shot. It's a long shot. On you know? Um, and so, yeah, it's like to be 60 yards from a monster bull. Yeah, you know, yeah. You're like, whoa, that's it's yeah. crazy to me. Um, it, it, it's cool, too, because you get that close. I mean, Clayson, I had a spike one time. We were 20 yards apart, and it went right in between us, so like 10 yards from us each, and it kind of stopped. Kind of knew something was up, but you can smell it. I mean, it, it peed, and it stopped and peed, and like kind of marking, and, you know, you can hear the breath. Um glunking is something that elk does kind of it doesn't bugle but kind of makes this noise that you have to be closer to hear and when you can get in like their bedroom and you can hear that it's it's something that your memory doesn't just it doesn't fade away very quickly at all even the the bugle i mean like the that's a while i mean so many people talked about it you've heard it a thousand but like when you experience it in person, mm. if it's in like a canyon, I mean, it's, it's going to sound the same way if you're on flatland and he's a hundred yards away. Yeah. But when you're in a canyon and it just amplifies oh, and you're so like, neat. it like almost, it's, it strikes excitement and fear at the same exact <laughs> yeah. time in yeah. your body. Yeah. And you're like, holy shit, uh-huh. that was real. Oh man. Like, you know? like, like Jurassic Park kind of. Yeah. My mom, mom, when I first moved up there was kind of like, so how's elk hunting? How's it work? How do you hunt them? And I said, well, I bugled one in the other day and she's like, what does that mean? And I was like, well, I'm basically at that, that one, I was kind of challenging bugling, like, all right, I want to come take your cows or whatever. And I'm, I'm challenging this other bull. And I said, so he kind of came in like he wanted to fight. And she goes, wait, he's coming in to fight like you're a bull and he has those big antlers on his head. I'm like, yes, it's (laughs) the adrenaline rush is awesome. She's like, I don't know if I like that. (laughs) Like, uh, but that, I think that, I don't know if it's just, a guy thing or what, but that kind of like edgy, you know, dangerous kind of thing. It's like, I, I like that. I like, you know, predator hunting, bear, mountain lion, and all that stuff. It's like, let's, I want let, to, let, let's let my heart get the rate up a little bit. Uh, it's, it's pretty, it's pretty neat, man. Though, like, like you're saying, the deer hunt is so much different than an elk and it's hard. I've never been all in mule deer yet, but you get up there in archery season and they're, those deer above tree line, you know, they're they're above. They're, they're always bed looking down. They're always looking for predators like mountain lion or coyotes or whatever. So you got to find a way stealthy enough to get up there without the wind and get a shot at them. And I mean, like this year, I had a stalk on one, and it was just the smallest thing. The whole story is kind of crazy because that morning I bugled right away, and a bull ran down to the other side of a meadow. I wasn't even ready. So I was like, shoot, I got to get into the trees because I was just trying to see if there's an elk out this morning. He like sprinted down. 
So I got in the trees. We went back and forth. I kind of saw him rubbing on this tree. Hunt didn't work out, but my plan was, all right, the wind's starting to, thermals are starting to change and go up. I need to get above this elk so I don't, you know, my, my scent doesn't get to him. So I was like, I need to get above where he was last and then just start side hilling and see if I can get on him again. And as I was going up, I just kept looking for other elk. Like, all right, I can't bump any other elk out of here because most of the time herd bulls, the mature big bulls will be, if you think about all these elk, he's in the center and the satellite bulls are the smaller ones on the outside and he has no reason to leave. Usually it's very hard to get a mature bull to kind of leave that area. And so I'm like, as I'm going up, I'm like, well, he's right there. I got to make sure there's not a cow here. There's a spike here. So they bust me, not just the one I'm trying to hunt, and everything goes out. And as I'm going up, I'm getting closer and closer to tree line, and I see two bucks coming down from eating, you know, grazing that morning. I'm like, with the deer tag in my pocket. So it went from this screaming back and forth with this bull, kind of running, getting position, getting set up, and like, all right, he might come here. No, he's not coming here. So 100 yards this way and getting set up to switching paces to I got to take my pack off, my boots off, and like tiptoe <laughs> to where these deer are. Yeah. And I got, man, it was, I mean, even this to me, I'll never forget. And it was awesome, even though I didn't get to shoot at the deer. I, but I got into this little basin right below tree line. They were coming right towards me. And I was like, man, this is, this is going to work out perfect. Don't even have to move there and walk right in front of me. And they ended up turning and going down this little basin. And it found this nice little bitty rock that kind of like poked off the edge. And I was like, all right, this is the spot. I know they can't, they're going to be come, working down. I know it. So I just, I'm sitting there, my release, the kind of release I have, you can actually have it on your string It's and pull through with your thumb and it'll release the bow, but it's kind of dangling on my bow. I'm holding my bow with the arrow knocked. And this was the first year I've hunted with that style release. The other style you can have, they go around your wrist and you use your pointer finger. And that one, since it's on your wrist, you kind of hook it on. Well, this one, I already pre had it hooked, not thinking about it because it's a new style. I ranged the first deer is at 32 yards, which, <clears throat> which for me, I was like, all right, this, I feel like I'm going to harvest. This is a good chance to take this deer. The bigger of the two deer, which is the one I want to shoot, was trailing behind the smaller deer. For whatever reason, I didn't have to because of my bow speed and the arrow flight. It wasn't going to change the trajectory or like distance enough to not hit the animal where I wanted, but I wanted to get one more range. Just like, okay, I want to make sure he's at this yardage. And I went to grab my rangefinder, and just that release, just barely kind of rocking on the string, it tapped the arrow in my quiver. Like, I mean, just the smallest little tap, and those deer were gone. <laughs> Whereas with the elk, you know, you could crack a stick, and he might look like, what was that? But it went from that, yeah, that super go, 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 go after elk to, like, slow it down. And then, uh, actually, that day, we were like, all right, let's go back into town, refuel, and come back out here. And I, somehow I got on this road, dude, and I was like, two wheels at one point and it looked like I was going to slide off the mountain and tight my like white knuckles on my steering <laughs> walls for an hour after adrenaline dumping through those you know the elk and deer hunt and I was like man this day this is I might just have to take this evening hunt <laughs> off and get this back because I'm worn out but oh god it is brutal man it is so uh your your company your brand that you got going on so uh what is it let errors fly yeah let errors fly and I've always man I've kind of started thinning out of my head a little bit, but I've always worn hats. And I was like, I kind of wanted to do, I had different, like one of the shirts I did was living life one era at a time. If you get, I mean, if with anything in life, you get overwhelmed, just take it one step at a time kind sure. of thing. Don't get overwhelmed. Like, oh, I got to pay this bill and this bill and this bill and they're all due next week. It's like, well, which one is the most important? What, what can I do first? You can only shoot one arrow out of your bow at a time. Well, you could shoot more, but yeah. ethically you can do one. So I kind of did it. I was like, that's for sure I want to make. I want to make like swag, hats, and, you know, start with gear. I always have little things for archery I'm trying to like work on. Like, all right, let's do a pocket quiver. You can hold your arrows in your pocket versus having it on your bow or laying them on the ground when you're practicing. And, um, but kind of, yeah, I started there to where it's like, all right, let's do hats, beanies, shirts. Um, I'm going to try to do like hoodies and stuff like that. And, but eventually, I mean, the right timing and place, location, everything, I, I, it'd be awesome kind of doing a shop kind of deal nice. so where you know you walk in and it's like you're talking about that community and everyone's close you walk in and there's you know a lounge with couches and coffee and it'd be awesome to have like a couple little you know weights and place to shoot there's target archery with paper and then the 3d like the, they look like animals and just kind of have different things set up and a little spot for kids to shoot and 
lessons and stuff like that. That's one thing at Goods that crossed my mind a lot is they had that one little bitty, you know, three, four person range. Mm-hmm. And that's the same range we had to tune in. So sometimes people are shooting and I have to go down there like, right, give me one sec, guys, I'll be done real quick, but I got to kind of shoot a couple through paper. So just getting it set up to where it's like, you know, you got your tuning, you got this target archery, 3D archery products and that. And that's kind of like future goal, kind of progressing towards that is like, it'd be great to have my own shot. I mean, I love it so much to, I mean, come shoot your bow, hang out, watch, you know, this one on the TV and a lot, you know, and just talk hunts or whatever. And I, the, you know, the biggest reason I left goods was I had opportunity. I got offered a job over at Skull Fab and it was pretty much the time to hunt. <laughs> That's biggest, you know, the biggest thing was I wanted to be able to hunt and have that experience. And, but then, you know, there's the parts too, where it's like, man, I really miss working on bows every day. And the customers, you know, all the, you know, us, everybody, I have so many friendships that came out of the archery shop, like good ones and, you know, gone hunting with them or done, you know, other things or, um, it's just, I, I like that community and it'd be cool to have that, you know, if it took off, it'd be cool to do it, you know, full time and have it running, you know, this area I think is great. The four corners, cause you have, you know, Utah, Arizona, all the people, you know, from Texas and stuff coming up. And it's like usually Durango, Pagosa, kind of one of the first stops. And uh, I think it'd be cool just to, you know, be able to do that and maybe have something else going, but have definitely have, get more people into it and share. And it doesn't even have to be hunting. It could be, you know, just going to do those like, you know, ski resort shoots. Those, those are so fun. Um, My mom's, she's, getting older now and still shoots and wants to go, you know, go to these 3d shoots and, uh, go up in the mountain. I told her, I was like, mom, it's still, it's still a hike. You take the ski lift up, but you're, you're kind of simulating what you do with the animals. I'll put them, uh, you know, through a couple of trees or, you know, your, the angle of your feet. And that's one thing too. I use not only to hang out with my friends and, and have a good time with archery, but these mountain shoots, especially versus Texas is if you're shooting a bow off flat ground versus on a mountain and your feet are uneven or you're shooting downhill uphill and your bow is canted, that dramatically changes, you know, how your arrow is going to come out. And then when you go into a hunting situation and put a broadhead on, and if your bow's not tuned, all those little bitty aspects of the mountain is going to magnify all that. Mm-hmm. So it's kind of a good, all right, let's go make sure all my gear's in, do this, hang out, learn, talk hunts or whatever, but by the time all these are over, they're going to be ending right when hunting season starts. And I know my sight sitting, this is, you know, in tune, my arrows flying good. And this person gave me until, oh, you got this tag here. You know, I saw this deer a couple of years ago and, um, and it's just the whole hangout. And now it's getting bigger and bigger, you know, Brandon shoot and tack where they have sponsored, you know, they give away hunts, they give away trucks, that black rifle coffee company goes and they'll have free coffee and, all kind of, I mean, it's just, it's, it's really cool. The, the people that are, I mean, just in the last three years, I feel like it's grown in popularity. I don't know if it's cause you know, like Rogan or Cam Haynes, you know, the, what social media is pushing, but I'm seeing more athletes like UFC fighters and football players and Derek Wolf that shot that Mount Lion last year. I think it's like, man, there's a lot of people that are getting archery now. Like it's, and, it, and I like it because, you know, keeping hunting alive and the sport and everything, especially kids, it's, it's good. I think it's good to have that, you know, you know, forefathers and people, I mean, way back when cavemen, we've always been hunting. Um, so to be able to keep those rights and, um, you know, all the regulations that come with it to be able to, you know, go and harvest an animal every year and the freedom to do that's pretty cool. And, and the numbers of people that go to these shoots or donate to this, you know, Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation yeah. that helps kind of keep that alive and keep the, you know, the awareness of what's going on in this state or this state. They're trying to, I think like right now in Colorado, they're trying to ban mountain lion hunting. Mm-hmm. And which is scary as shit, man. Like yeah. the, the mountain lion sightings this year in our local area were like 70% higher than they've been in like the last previous it's 10 years. Yeah. Like, and it's, if you've never been out hunting, for anybody listening to this, if you've and I've talked about it, I think when we had the uh, hunting buddies, those uh, those guys came on, and um, dude, it is. You talk about something striking, absolute. I don't care how big of a man you are, like how much you know fear you are in a cage or on a football field or a basketball court, bro. A 
fucking mountain That's lion scary. will strike absolute fear. If you oh, yeah. see it at a distance, you your spidey senses go up, <laughs> yep. and it's it's scary. And like when they start coming coming down closer, because it's easier, you know, it's way easier to pick up a cat. It's way easier mm-hmm. to pick up a dog. Easier to pick up the in town deer that just mm-hmm. live here, right? Mm-hmm. They, they're basically domesticated animals. That that shit's scary, man. So it, it always freaks me out when they start to outlaw, you know, um, mountain lion hunting specifically. Bear is. It, there, there's a whole nother caveat of questions mm-hmm. around that. And, you know, I don't necessarily disagree with it at all, but mountain lion, it's like, man, you have to, you have to manage that population. You have to, because yeah. if not, they, they will just run rampant. Oh, like yeah. they'll just, you know, and it's just like, you know, have so many people that are opposed to it and they've got their sides of the opinions. And I'm like, I, I said something to you the other day, cause our, um, our, uh, our son was on the, uh, the cross country team before soccer season started because he wanted to get his cardio up, right? So he joined the soccer, uh, the the uh, cross country team, right. and they they stopped running up the mountain on the backside of our water tower here in town because there was a mountain lion sighting. Oh yeah, and I was like, okay, so <laughs> hold on, wait a second. So we 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 told all these children, right, forty five kids out there running from sixth grade to, to high school, to say don't run up that hill, but we didn't do anything to talk about the situation, like. You know what I mean? And it's hard with the mountain lion, right? You can't just grab them and relocate them. Like they have a linear range of 70 miles, right? Most people don't know that. So it's like you could relocate them in Cortez and they'll be back here in two weeks. Oh yeah. You know? And so that's an animal like we really need to be, we need to be cautious about outlawing that hunt because whether you disagree with it or not, it has to be managed. However you want to get on the argument or the bandwagon about how that's managed, completely different conversation, but it has to be managed. Right. I did. I actually got, um, was lucky enough to go with some friends to go on a mountain lion hunt and talk to them, you know, just about the cats, you know, just say from here to Durango, because they they do it all every winter. That's you know they they have the dogs and the hounds and they go and you know get on these mountain lions and the amount of mountain lions just last year they saw just near Durango is astonishing. It's like holy cow, you saw that many in a week that close to town, and then they start getting to the subject of well in the winter time they'll close the gates. Unless you're a snowmobiler, but a lot of times if you have the, you know, you can go with your dogs and stuff, but you can only, only a certain amount of people that run dogs for cats, you know, they stop at a certain point. So all these areas that are, you know, the gates are closed or something, the cats, you know, they're um, if taking deer, mostly the deer is kind of like the big one they go for, but the, you know, fawn, elk and that. And if there's not, because if you think what else in the woods is going to take a mountain lion out besides a hunter, which is very rare. I have didn't ever see one until I went on that mountain lion hunt. I know I've probably been close, and I've kind of felt like on my back of my neck, like, and I feel like there's a, something watching me, mm-hmm. a mountain lion or something. But besides hunters in this part of Colorado, there's not a lot of stuff that's going to take down a mountain lion besides natural death. Um, I mean, a bear could, but them actually kind of that kind of interaction happening is very low and so it's like well something's got to keep the numbers down and they just kind of i think two or three years ago they went to all draw for the area we're in for elk instead of just going to the local sporting goods store and walmart buying a tag and taking your bow out and hunting anywhere they kind of put it to where like you have to draw for this unit even though it's not a trophy unit you still have to kind of put in and draw a tag because the elk herds were hurting. Well, with, you know, more bear, you know, in the springtime, they're coming out, they're hungry, so they'll go look for fawns or baby deer and, the, you know, mountain lions. That's just, that's going to kind of put a hurting on that herd and kind of keep taking it down. So there is a management for it. And I know the wool thing just passed, but that's the big thing is like, if it is put in place where wolves are coming back or mountain lions are being and how are we going to manage that numbers to where everything kind of balances? Because, I mean, it's a lot different, too, than, like, I mean, people bring up, like, the wolf thing with Yellowstone. Look how, you know, they're doing okay in Yellowstone, but Yellowstone's not huntable either. And there's a lot more animals, you know, reproducing and growing and getting big because you're not allowed to hunt there. So that wolf pack is kind of helping Yellowstone manage that because, well, there's no hunter, so these are what's going to keep that number mm-hmm. down in that area. But for here, you know, with the pressure, the herds, you know, kind of hurting a little bit, it's, there's got to be some kind of management. And it was, it, 
I was, of any, I mean, there's always that adrenaline rush and kind of like, you know, you get a little tense sometimes with certain animals, but, and I've done that in Texas with the hogs, you know, they got the big tusk and you're close, and you're like, oh, that's getting a little sketchy. But that mountain lion, even though it was in the tree, and I had this, you know, at one point when I kind of made eye contact, like, okay, if this dude comes out and he's mad at me, like, what, what's my first move? Or what am, what am I going to do if he jumps, you know, pounces on me or when he's injured or whatever the case. Um, ended up, you know, working out real good, getting the cat. The meat is delicious if you've never had it. The, I think the mental part of it's probably the hardest part, but it's, it's like sweet pork. Mm-hmm. We had chorizo tacos are great and regular breakfast sausage tacos. And But I think it's the the mindset, I guess, like bear and cats, because I've, I've heard people, oh, you, you killed the deer, how me, and this and that, but I know the reason I'm out there doing it is for the meat. It's not, I want that, those antlers, or I want that rug, or I want this. It's need to get, you know, this organic food from the forest, provide my family, friends with me. And then, you know, if, if it has big antlers or you can get a rug, it's, oh, cool, that's sweet. Let's, let's add that to this whole experience. But I have never felt like so many people have, lash back because I shot a cat, you know, the, the comments I was getting on, whether it be Facebook, Instagram or whatever of, I hope it rips your head off or I hope you die. Could you kill the cat? Why would you do that just for the rug? Not knowing that it's not just for, you know, the sport and holding the cat up or, or it's, Oh, the meat's really good. And you can eat a cat. My mom even asked me when I shot it and I told her, she's like, are you going to eat that? And I was like, Oh yeah. Mm-hmm. And she had, it, it was super impressed by it and took it down to texas we went on a pig hunt i took you know four or five pounds down there we had tacos and i mean it's it's awesome i mean, i i feel like if you can if you're a good enough cook or have a creative enough mind any wild game there's some way you can cook it that it's it'll be pretty good you know what i mean for the most part there's there's a dish or a way you could cook it to where it's like okay this is this is awesome i want to do it again yeah and, i mean to your to your comment though as far as people just going in hard i saw that but you know what everybody not everybody but a lot of people need a sword to die on right they need they need to be able to jump onto something that's opposing what they're seeing to mm-hmm. make themselves feel warm and fuzzy yeah. about themselves that day it absolutely has nothing to do with you probably even the scenario of seeing a cat it's just something that they're able to jump on and, and there's this other community that's attacking you and all of a sudden now they're part of this community because they may not have anything in life that makes them feel like that, right? right. But for that one moment, they've got a little bit of endorphins running and they're feeling good yeah. and they're all part of this. Let's attack this fucking guy who killed this cat because this is wrong. Right. Tell me how it's wrong, right? Yeah. And then before you start to point the finger, yeah. let's look at what your scenario is. Why the fuck are you so mad and angry at the world and things that are going on that you got to go in at Christian? Mm-hmm. Why? Why? What has he ever done yeah. to you? He's yeah. holding up a picture of this thing about doing something that he loves to do, right? He's going to eat the meat. He's going to take care of this. He's going to manage the population, which is dangerous. People have died from it. Kids have mm-hmm. died from it, uh, from, from, from a mountain lion specifically. Um, mm-hmm. So where, where's the actual wrong in that, right? So the, the reality of it is, is like when it comes back to when, when, when you constantly ask that question to somebody, it's like they answer it with some bullshit regurgitated thing they've seen online a thousand times. Yep. They're just jumping on this bandwagon to attack you because they got nothing to look forward right. to in their own lives. Yep. You know, so it's like, take all that shit with a grain of salt. I'm sorry that it happened. I saw it happening, yeah. but it was just like, man, it, I knew you, you see somebody, I mean, even with that, that football player that was holding that monster cap, yeah, dude, he got cool. so much backlash, right? Oh, yeah. Then what happens? He goes on Rogan. All of a sudden he gets this like, oh my God, over yeah. amount of praise. Yeah. And it's like, you know what? You, there's, there is no happy medium between people with that. You're either in the camp or you're out of the camp. Right. And so it's, you know, take it with a grain of salt, do what you're going to do. Keep hunting. Um, it's your thing. Like it's gotta be managed. And if you have an opportunity to do that, then why not? Right. Like, yeah, you did get a rug. Sure. You put up a picture of that today. It's beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. Fucking gorgeous. But you're eating the meat. Right. Right. And that's good too. Yeah. yeah. So. And that's what, like, I mean, and the end, my final mindset with all that backlash stuff is like, I did everything legal. I shot it. I cleaned it, took all of me. I'm eating it. I mean, I utilized every part of the animal I could. Um, so maybe save. I don't know how many deer over the next year before you can hunt them again. It's lives. So, so it's, I know all the reasons I'm doing it. And I even kind of, when I got back into bow hunting, I went through my mind because I got, I mean, I love dogs and pets and stuff. I got a real soft heart. Even there's sometimes I, I'll shoot an animal and there's, a, I get choked up a little bit like, man, like if it was 
not as quick as it should have been. You know, it took an extra 10, 20 seconds and I kind of walked up and the animal's expiring. That, it gets me. I still got like a, a soft, spot, soft spot in my heart. So, I mean, I know I'm out there to do it quick and ethically, get the meat, you know, get it back to, you know, whoever I could provide it to. And so it, I don't, at the end of the day, it's like, it might bother me that like, man, don't be, I don't want anybody to be upset with me. Like if you, if you're out there and you ate this, you might understand, but at the end of the day, it's like, I'm doing everything legal the right way. So I kind of, you know, I'll, I'll hear them, but it's, it doesn't, doesn't affect me too. It's like, oh, I'm not going to do that again. Cause yeah. everyone's going to get mad. <laughs> if I can get, if I can get one this year, I'd do it again. <laughs> Somebody's going to get mad at you for no, no matter what, yeah. what you do. I mean, um, Going back real quick to uh, to the to the conversation about your your the future of uh, Let Arrows Fly the store the the camaraderie thing I think that's excellent man and I I think you should push for that because you said something earlier in the show um, and it reminded me of like hunting with my grandfather when I was growing up right like duck hunting and there's such an element about hunting that it's unfortunate for those that don't like hunting I understand you might have your reasons for not liking it but the experience that you get out get out of hunting especially from the old timers like what I've seen is like a, a lot of our the younger generation when I say gratification right that can't happen with hunting it's mm-hmm. super hard you don't get it but also you 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 want to be heard. You want to constantly say something, and you want to you want to either act like an expert or be treated like an expert. But when you when you're in the hunting community, I don't really care how old old you are. If you're if you're younger, the oldest guy in that group with his hunting stories, everybody shuts the fuck up yeah. and they listen to him. Yeah, because he's got historical factual data. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes it could be a fish story, but he's got stories worth listening to. Oh yeah, and you know, we did this, and this is how you would do this, and everybody just gets quiet, man. When the old man's in the room mm-hmm. and he's talking about this or that. It's like, it's such a dying thing because like respect has left a lot of conversations in our, in our current world. But in that realm, in that world, in that community, like people have that respect. It's a direct line. Like, and, and the other thing too, is that so many people are coming into it because we've lost touch with who we are at our genetic core at times. Mm -hmm. Like we forget that we can also be self-reliant and provide for ourselves. It's hard work. It's not yeah, easy, yeah. but we've forgotten because it's been, it's so easy to go buy a ribeye steak. And oh, I yeah. love a ribeye yeah. steak. Yeah. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> yeah. It's so easy to go to the store and buy that. And we've just become conditioned to, to think that that is the answer. Yeah. But when people start to see other people do this and then they have the opportunity to go out there and be a part of this community and maybe get lucky enough to, to actually harvest an animal, they know, just like you were saying, I know where this came from. I know the amount of work that went into it. So I think people are realizing that it's better to be self-reliant and know exactly where my meat's coming from, mm-hmm. know exactly where my vegetables are coming from, right. know exactly all the work and not just you and your girlfriend, but the amount of people that that harvest fed. Yeah, it's a like lot. It's, it's, it, because that builds back into the community, right? Oh, yeah. And I think that's why so many people are coming into it, right? And they also, going back to the old man, when they get into that community, they start to realize that there's a level of respect from the ground floor to the top. And it doesn't mean that you can't ever get to the top or that you can't be one of those guys, but people start to realize that like, this is my time to shut up and listen yeah, and learn sure. versus trying to be an expert when I know nothing about it. There's no space in the hunting world to be a charlatan. It's, and it takes time to be an expert. It takes lots. loss. It takes failure. Oh, it yeah. takes shooting 3,000 arrows and going out your first year and making a botch mistake yeah. and not getting anything. Oh, yeah. Thanks. And so that's why I think so many people are coming into it. Um, but more importantly, you know, and I'm a huge take the fucking leap guy, but I think you need to move as fast as possible and do this thing that, that is your dream. And, and I know that financially that may not make sense, but maybe somebody's listening to this mm-hmm. and they go, you know what? Boom, Christian can do this because spaces like that, especially in the hunting community, they're only at a bow shop, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. Their own, but you know, you go to the bow rack in Salt Lake or you go wherever, wherever you want to go. But like what you're talking about building, like the space for the old men to tell the stories yep. and also having this thing that I want to show people, I want to train people. I want to get the new generation coming in and be excited about bow hunting. Yep. Dude, that is fucking unheard of. That's yep. cool. That's a, that's an, that's taking your passion and making a space for everybody else to have a piece of your passion and yep. be invited into it. And like, 
I, I hope that succeeds. It, I really it, do because that's that's a that's a cool concept. And uh, yeah, if you if if anybody hears about this, talk to Christian about that because I I don't want to see that get lost in the weeds of it all, man. It's exciting. I uh, yeah, I've talked to a few people, um, kind of you know just recently, and and you know, first thinking about when I was getting this going about you know the steps I need to take to get it to that you know finished kind of product. Um, but yeah, I think when I started at Goods. There's so much stuff that I realized, I mean, Delhi's some guy that's just so filled with knowledge. You can just sit there, like you said, and just shut up and listen, and you're going to learn something. And there'll be times you're just going through stuff. And, I mean, my mom was one of the first people. She was like, man, that looks fun. I want to get a compound bow. She shot a long bow in college and messed around, but never had shot one with all the, you know, gadgets and accessories. So took her to the bow shop. And you have to look through this whole thing in the string called PEEP. And that PEEP aligns with your sight. There's a release. There's all these different factors versus just pulling the string back with your fingers and letting it go like an old recurve. And she got a bow in that first week. She was like, man, I do not like this. I don't get it. She didn't know how to hold it. She was intimidated because it's faster. And I just started going through all these little steps to hold it like this, look like this. And once she grasped the concept of how to aim and shoot and she was hitting the target, it was like the funnest thing for her that I've seen my mom enjoy in, in years. You know, at her age, she's had these things, you know, horse riding and dancing and stuff she's done all her life. But now there's this new, this archery thing. This is awesome. And I kind of took that. And when I was at Goods and I'd, someone was new, you know, I'd kind of go through all those steps. And be time I was done, they're like, do you give lessons or do you, you know, can you do this for my son? And I didn't realize this was so in depth with archery and you can do this to make the arrow flight different and this and this and it was just so cool to see like you know i'm you know the knowledge i can share with someone else is is you know growing through them or they might take in and share it with someone and it, that it just feels good when you know you're helping so you know there's something you're doing in the community or, or through the archery community that's like you're improving it and helping someone and not only just archery hunting for me, it's not just going and getting an animal or going and shooting a target. It, I mean, I have learned so many life lessons from archery and people you're with too. You'll learn real quick after a day or two, depending on how hard you're hunting, of how their mindset is and how much they can put up with. And if they're positive or negative, if they fall in the mud, are they going to get all mad and give up? Are they going to laugh and keep going? I mean, it's there's so many things you can take from elk hunting and apply it to you know your job or um, school or whatever it is. And it's just cool to be able to do, you know, take my failures or what I have learned and be like, try this next time. Or instead of doing this, do this like Byron did to me. And then just seeing people like, you know, being, you know, more successful. And I know a lot of people, I've had this discussion where they're like, oh, you give too much information that everyone's going to know how to hunt. This can be harder to hunt. But I'd rather it be where everyone's going out there and having an opportunity or chance mm -hmm. than, you know, not keeping everything secret. And I think, I think eventually Colorado, there was on the survey this year, would you rather hunt every year or would you rather skip more and have more mature animals and more healthier herds? And from pretty much everyone I heard, it's let's wait longer to get a tag. So it's better hunting versus dealing with all the pressure, all the tags, the animals are quiet because they're, you know, they, they kind of start sensing that. And, but yeah, I, I, uh, I got some other little ideas with it that are pretty creative that if it all comes together, I think it'll be cool little, I mean, for all ages and even walks in archery, like it, you never picked up a bow to someone who's shot Vegas, you know, competition in Vegas mm -hmm. and feel like they can come in and get what they need out of the shop, you know, whether it's info or just a place to shoot or their, their retail, you know, goods and, um, I mean, it's just, it's, it's fun. I get excited every time I talk to someone and someone overhears me and comes and asks questions. It's like, I tell my girlfriend or my parents when I was with them, I'm like, all right, y'all are going to have to end this conversation because <laughs> I won't stop talking about archery until someone pulls me away. Sure. <laughs> no, I mean, I, you know, I felt that firsthand, you know, when I came in, you know, to, to goods, obviously, you know, and like I said, and, um, I don't mean it negatively, but you know, Eric's a big guy. He's, you know, he's a little bit intimidating and he's also running a business. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, but so he was like, here's Christian, he'll take care of you. And, and so, you know, you guys got me set up, but it was, it was more than that. It was like, I had questions and I had, you know, kind of that first timer sort of, 
um, imposter syndrome. Like, what the fuck am I doing? Like, I don't know anything about archery, but it's like, man, that was not there with you. And I think that was what like really struck a relationship of like, okay, I know there was, I mean, there was many a times, like if I went in and I needed something, like even if it was Clayson, cause I didn't really know Clayson at first, Clayson's fine now. Um, but like at first it's like, if Clayson was working, I'd leave. Like not, not like I had never had a bad experience, but like I was comfortable with you. Right. It's almost like a tattoo. That's artist. exactly you get, what I was going to say. You get a tattoo artist. Like he's just my guy. I'm going to yep. do this. But it was, it was so comfortable and, and I could ask you anything. I could ask you the dumbest shit about bows and it'd be like, yeah, this is what, you know, it, you would have to do this and da, 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 da. And so for me, it was, it was one of those things. It was like, it allowed me to be heavily vulnerable in something I had no knowledge about zero. Like I had shot a bow, same thing as your mom, pretty, you know, recurve in high school type thing. Right. Um, I bought that PS, PSI, shot it at the range at goods, went home, started shooting on the target. Right. And then mm-hmm. I came back and got the Hoyt and it was like, Oh, well you could do this. And, you, and it, it changes. Like when you get a different level of bow, mm-hmm. the abilities of what that bow can do are fucking gigantic above yeah. like a lower level bow. Yeah. Um, unfortunately there comes a price tag to that, but it does give you an advantage of increasing your, you know, um, effectiveness, yeah. right. Of shooting. And so you were like, clear about you know hey here's all the things and no question was dumb which was that i i took away from that is for me it was like you were willing to give me any shred of knowledge that i asked you about right Mm -hmm. it's just like i'm not going to hold anything back and so when i see that when i when i get that from another person like it was that was a, a huge deal with my electrical company when i had it like if i had a journeyman that I had paired up with an apprentice and I found out that that journeyman was like holding information and would not teach the way, like I would rip that fucker's ass, dude. Mm-hmm. I would be like, no, this is not the game we're playing, man. Yeah. Every yeah. house in the world, every building has electrical. There's more work than we could ever shake a stick at. Your job is to teach that kid that doesn't know anything. So that way that he can be a benefit right. and an asset to you in yeah. a year. Yeah. And so you, you took that approach and that's exactly how my mindset is like, you know, I'm going to tell this person who I barely know everything that he wants to know about this. And so I, I think you take that approach that I know that worked on me, put that into this deal that you're doing. Sky's the limit, man. Yeah. I I'm, honestly think it's, yeah, it's beautiful. I love hearing it. Yeah. I'm excited about, like I said, goal driven and stuff. It's a big one. So I'm, I mean, I'm constantly in every little, little segment of time I have to work on it. I'm putting some kind of thought or, or work into it, money, whatever it is to, to grow it. And, um, like you're saying, I, I love, you know, bringing someone new into it. And there's times people come in and could be a little intimidated, whether it be, you know, Eric or just a wall full of 50 <laughs> bows. And they're like, I want to shoot yeah. a bow. What, where do I start? I shouldn't say, I, Eric's not that intimidating. Yeah. I'm, I, he's my neighbor. He, he's so I'm, a big ta- guy. I'm, <laughs> just, I'm just talking shit. Eric yeah. is not that intimidating, but anyway, sorry to be interrupted. He, he's, he's like, Eric is uh, like six, five, six, six. And he's, he's got a be getting 275 or so out of that body but he's a he's a big guy gentle giant though but yeah the appearance and his knowledge he can definitely kind of make you be a little uh weird on asking a few questions but yeah you walk in and ask for a bow there's been people you know guys i try to relate to people you know if i can tell from our conversation whatever that had been in that first five minutes or what they're wearing or something if guy came in with a you know snap on shirt or something and he looks at the wall and he said I want to get a bow. I have no idea. Where do I go? And I'll say, well, it's kind of like quarter mile race or something. You can get there with a little import supercharge or muscle car. They might get there at the same time, but there's different styles. There's different fills. There's, I'm taller. So a bow that's longer from the axle axle where the cam spin over is going to be more appropriate for me because of the string angle. By the time I pull it back that far or, um, they're more forgiving versus if you're in the East coast, hunting whitetail in a tree, you might want something more compact to fit it in those limbs. Um, So it kind of suits, I'm not a real big skier or snowboarder I have, but I know there's different styles of skis for different stuff. You know, you got the, you know, downhill, you got the, the trick ones, there's all different kinds of styles you can do. So I kind of get a mindset of what do you want to spend? What type, how much are you going to do it? How much do you want out of the bow? And then just kind of start going from there. And like you said, you can get a bow and they're all going to get the job done. If you get in Colorado, it's 35 pounds or more to be legal to hunt. And so many bows do that. And you can get a bow that costs 300, 400 bucks with 
everything you need to go out and hunt and it'll get the job done. But then if you bought, I mean, with kind of anything bicycling or anything, if you get the higher quality, you'll start noticing less vibration, tighter groups of your arrows, more speed, which accounts for more penetration, which is more ethical, you know, for getting into a, say a big body moose or elk or something, the more penetration into the animal, the better chance it's going to die quicker, which is ultimately what you want when hunting. But, and then I actually just got a target bow this last year. Um, I've shot these competitions on paper where they, you, you score considering how close you are to the bullseye. And I've always just used my hunting bows and, oh, this is fun. And so this is the first year I'm actually kind of diving into target archery where it's lower poundage. The arrows are actually fatter so you can break the line. They're like logs. So if you're using a hunting arrow, the shaft is four millimeters. So it's, you know, really small shaft. Target arrow is real big because it's made to get the higher point. But a hunting arrow, you need better penetration. So the smaller arrow allows less friction to go into the animal deeper. So, I mean, between traditional target hunting, uh, if you go to these, like the competition archer shoots, they have tons of different classes you can do. They have mm-hmm. compound, target, traditional, compound with no sights where you're you're shooting a compound, but you're having to guess like a recurve and people just kind of, you know, might dabble here or there and then fall in and this is, that's their niche. They like to do Olympic recurve or they like to do bow hunter freestyle and um the thing i like about it is compound is definitely what i hunt with the most traditional to me it's it's cool that'd be the coolest way to take an animal is it's just thick and string it's it's a lot harder it's almost like um i feel like real fishing versus fly fishing there's more of like an art i guess and feel to the traditional and compounds more mechanical kind of thing um but i enjoy them all and it's cool to see like at you know these archery shoots where they have a elk target at 100 yards and if you hit this playing card you win this shirt or something and there's guys shooting their recurves and the guy with the compound and everyone's just flinging arrows and and enjoying it but it's um there's kind of different groups but they all come together at the end of the day you know knowing how tough it is and and sharing those stories because once once you've been through it and you know that's a lot of work that took a lot of figuring out and then someone else is getting into that it's like you're you're rooting for them you're pumped for them and then you know like when they succeed like you said i i'm finding more joy the older i get the more hunts i go on someone else getting in and being able to share that with them or i don't mind solo hunting it's fun sometimes i get out there and i get to you know i get to think about what's on my mind or clear my mind or whatever but some of the best moments i've ever had and some of the hardest ones is like when i the first bull i was by myself and i shot it and i was like can't tell my dad i can't tell my buddy like i'm all i was happy but there's no high fives Mm -hmm. there's no fist pumps and i ran up to the top of the mountain trying to get service to call and i was like i don't have service so i didn't get that that moment of sharing clap you know all that that really good and you know i I, this goal's completed Mm -hmm. we're about to you know get this thing off the mountain and so when i you know get to the points where i'm with a buddy and he shoots an elk or someone's with me and i shoot an elk it that feels really good to be able to share that with someone else and then of course you know you know the whole grind packing out and everything and everyone gets to the truck and you're tired and then you go you know you go eat a meal or something it's those are them i've had so many cool things you know sports games i've went to and saw, seen them win out of you know spurs when they're winning championships hit a game winner in the playoffs or something and all exciting but it's comparing to elk hunting or bow hunting and it's i can't compare it to anything it's it's a different different feeling that's for sure and it's it's good for um shoot body mind spirit everything i think because I'm, I'm working out to get healthy my mind's always thinking and working and then you know just knowing that you took something ethically and something it like it does something for your soul that you do it the right way it's not like a slaughterhouse where they're pinging them in the head mm-hmm. or something so it it's it's good and then it's it's funny because i I just told my girlfriend when I first met, and I was like, I'm pretty simple. You know, there's things, you know, my faith, my family, and I was like hunting and my job, but I was like pretty much my mind goes back to hunting, like getting back to the woods. Uh, That quote I like, I'd rather be lost in the woods than found in the city. You know, I don't mind doing stuff. I like going downtown. I like, you know, going and seeing a show here or there, but there's something about going and 
into nature. It's always different. This animals could be doing something else. Or you're going to, what am I going to see today? And what am I going to find today? And that, I think that not knowing that hope of like, man, I hope I get something today or hope I see something. It's, that's something that's good too, is because you're always out there. If it was, if you knew where they were, it'd be killing, I guess. Cause mm-hmm. you know, okay, yeah. I'm going to go right there and I'm going to shoot them. It's over. But that hope, it's like, I don't know if they're out there, but I saw them yesterday and then you go and they're not there. What if they're over that next ridge and you go and, and sometimes they are, sometimes they're not, but it's, you constantly like, you have that kind of excitement. Like today could be the day kind of with the bear thing. I was like, I have, even though I'm tired and it's rainy, I got to go. Cause it could be the day could that the, the bear day. comes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think you're, uh, you kind of poking at that genetic core when you're hunting, mm-hmm. right? You're, uh, something about it, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's in us, uh, whether people want to admit it or not, it's in us all. Right. Yep. And so the other thing too, about sharing that with other people is, um, that's also in it, right? Handing that down from the elders to the new generation, teaching people how to hunt, how to survive, how to be in this, you know, in this world, maybe it's not teaching you how to hunt, how to survive, but it's reminding you of what you can do, mm-hmm. what you could do. Yep. Uh, you know, and so I think there's a weird genetic core that you're kind of tickling a little bit when you're, when you're doing oh, yeah. that, that act, right? Whether it's solo hunting or whether it's that, you know, you harvest and you have this kind of celebratory feeling because you're, you're, you're overwhelmed with gratefulness that you've just harvested and you get to provide food. And yeah, we live in a world now to where you're going to eat other things beside elk. Yeah, absolutely. For sure. But still tickling that genetic core, right? Where it's like that. In years past, that that was it. That mm-hmm. might have been the meal that allowed us to kind of get through the winter months, you yeah. know. And so, um, there's something about it, man. It's it's um, it's a weird feeling. But, it's it, I agree with you. It's it's a bit unlike any other feeling. And I and I going back to it, I I think that a lot of people that have never had that feeling, when they do get it, they're like, whoa, what what was that? Yeah. Like, I mean, uh, you know, especially some of these guys. I'm seeing you're seeing a lot of like. Um, professional athletes, um, but many of them coming from like a team environment where there's a little bit of that camaraderie or a lot of bit of that camaraderie effect, but in akin to like the hunting world, right? Where they're, they're kind of, I don't know, they're, they're, they're getting absolute fulfillment out of something yeah. where they might be lost a little bit, you yeah. know, and it's just like everything else goes to the wayside uh, when, yeah. when you're hunting. Like you can only focus on that moment. So true. And, and it's like, it, it gets all the other bullshit out of there. And so, you're, true. so it's like, you're, you're in the mix, you're in the battle, yep. you're dealing with this and you have to sometimes make moments decisions. But when you, when you are lucky and you get to harvest and you get to kind of like, I don't know, hold that story and tell that story a year or two or 50 years down the road yeah. about that specific moment. It's like, you're, again, you're just, you're teaching the lessons and passing it down to the next generation. Yeah. And so, I don't know. I think there's something inside of all of us that, you know, we're, we're meant to hunt, in my opinion, and, and we don't as a mass society anymore. There's just, there's a, you know, it, the hunting community is massive. But in the grander scale of all human beings on the world, it's, 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 it's microscopic. Yeah. Um, so, I agree with you. The more people that get to experience it, I mean, there's animals out there, right? Yeah, I, we want to make sure how are we hunting them. But you know, it shouldn't be guarded. It should be something because it's, it is, it, if, if we don't teach it and we don't tell the stories and get the new generations into it, it will die off. Yeah. It'll, it'll be gone forever. Right. So we, we have a fiduciary responsibility to make sure that the generation below us is aware of it. Cool. And if it's not necessarily hunting in your world, like if that's not your thing, if it's fishing, boom, same, yep. same act, right? Right. Conservation. Yeah. Climate. It's like you, you have to, you have to hand this down because if we don't, two generations it's gone yep. keep so it's like we we have that responsibility of and making sure that we're doing our part to keep it alive i think i kind of noticed a little bit about kind of sharing it not even with the younger generation but when covid hit there's a whole crazy toilet paper thing but i know beef there's certain meats at the store and i had elk meat but like you said every now and again it's like oh i'll, I'll mix some beef with it or do this and i went to get something everything was gone and i actually had a few friends from texas and other places like hey I need to learn how to shoot a bow because so, I don't have meat and I don't know how to find it. And they're not in a panic state, but almost like I kind of want to learn how to survive on my own if I had to or be self-sufficient where I don't have to depend on 
this meat coming to the store and if it's out in this. And I think with that move and hunting, that, that's one really good thing I got out of it. It's like, I know I can go, I can go get this if I need to and bring it home and people are fed and not be so reliant on the convenience of there's a grocery store 10 miles down there or, you know, and the simplicity of it. Like you said, you get out there and you forget it. The older I get, I feel like simple is better. You know, just the less I can have or the, it just seems like life flows better. It's more enjoyable. But when I get out in the woods, it's like, like I don't really think about my job. It might cross my mind, but it, briefly. But I get out there and I'm locked in to the animals world. They don't know. I mean, they might see a road with cars, but they don't know what's going on at five o'clock in Bayfield or they don't know that this person's got to eat lunch at 12 at their job. They're doing their thing. They have, they breed, they eat, they sleep and they have that, you know, that fear of predators. So, and they kind of go through that cycle. So when I get in that world, it's, to, you know, it's, it's relaxing. And then you get, you know, you start learning about it. Some of the people I know that care about animals the most and put money back to help those animals or their habitat are hunters because <laughs> they start realizing how kind of intimate it gets when you get closer, you start cleaning them and it's like, man, this is something special. So, um, it's preservation. Mm -hmm. You know, you want to, you want to protect that experience you had right. because you, you want to be able to share that with the next person. Keep it going. You yeah. want somebody else to experience it. Yeah. There's a selfish aspect to it, right? Everything we love has a tiny bit of, you know, selfishness behind mm -hmm. it. But like, if I, if I got the experience to do something that I enjoyed so much and it was in abundance, I would absolutely share that with the next person. Yeah. I think everybody is of that mind, right? It's only when we feel scarce about things that we want to guard it. So, yeah. you know, so closely and we charge, you know, fucking 70% yeah. more than we did last year. Um, but yeah, so I think it's like when you get to experience that, whatever that is with nature, maybe, maybe it's like our removal, this, this gap that we've kind of created. And like, all of a sudden you get to dip back into what it might've used to have been like, mm -hmm. yep. you have a, a slight realization of like, this is where we came from, yeah. you know, yeah. it's, it, uh, it strikes you and you, you, you want other people to almost like believe you in the weirdest way. Like you, you, you could go tell the story if nobody had ever gone hunting before, but you went hunting and you came back. You would sound like a fucking crazy person. Yeah, I mean, like yeah. I it just like I was overwhelmed and all these feelings, and they would be like, "What are you talking? You just went into the woods. Like, what is the big deal?" But it's like one of those things. It's like it's an experience. It's almost like it is just that. It has to be experienced. Yep. The stories That's are funny. not good enough. The stories would get the next generation to come into it. Yeah. But it, yeah, you 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 want to you want to preserve that. Yeah. You want to make sure that somebody else down the road gets the opportunity to come experience exactly what you did. And, and, and yeah, absolutely. Every tag, every gun or piece of ammo. Um, I don't know how it is with archery, but a lot of the companies I know every, they have a small tax on each one of those. Mm. What does that do? It goes directly back into the state and the federal governments that goes back into, you know, management. Yep. There's a lot of things in the world that are sold. You buy a loaf of bread, you're in a cent of that that's going yeah. back into your favorite thing that you love, right? right? <laughs> or at least you can't track it. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, mo hunters are conservationists. That's know? one reason, too. Like, uh, I mean, the time I shot my mountain lion, I didn't think I was even going to hunt. I was like, I'll, I'll get a tag just in case and then maybe go out, you know, go out there. And But a lot of times when I'm buying these tags and I don't get anything, I'm like, well, this is tag soup. I'm like, it's going, at least it's going back into it to where it's, you know, it's going to, they're going to go, you know, do research over here or, or help this cinema or bring in this or, you know, do something to help the state or, you know, the whole country kind of grow or improve on what species needs help here or there. And, um, it's, it's definitely, uh, it's definitely taken over my life, as you know. It's it's crazy because I mean, when growing up as like I said, school sports family, and I bow hunted. But now that I know how much, besides getting the meat and going to have fun shooting my bow, like it has affected not only me but people I've been you know hunting with or my family. And in Texas, I got there. You can shoot so many pigs, and I was working on my buddy's ranch, and you know, I'd archery or rifle, I go down there and shoot a couple in a day or a weekend, and I had plenty of meat because I'd shoot a pig every weekend. So I'd call up all my friends or text all my family. But I have 
all these pigs sitting there in ice chest that they're already quartered up. You just have to come get what you want. And it just, it just felt good that, you know, they could take home a leg of an animal and feed their family for a little bit. And that's something that since a small age, I always like people being happy with like my service to them or like giving, gifting stuff, like giving people stuff to, you know, open up and make them small. And that's like one of the best gifts because it's, you know, it's nutrition for their body. It's it's just everything feels, you know, pure and, and wholesome. I, I feel like if you do it ethically, it's, it's there's not much I can compare to it, yeah. <laughs> that, that feeling. No, there's not, man. And it, it is, you know, I hope everybody gets to experience that, you know, um, that type of community. It's different. You know, I talked to a lot of guys. The only thing I could, that I, I've never experienced this, but like you hear a lot of um, jujitsu fight guys. Like they say like that brotherhood, that camaraderie, mm-hmm. you know, there's just something about just sharing stories of like, just getting your ass kicked. Or something, that's right? what it is. It's something that's absolutely humbling. It yeah. brings people together. It's yeah. like, oh, if I can share in this humility with another person, yeah. it's like, yeah. yeah. And then I can share in the joys and the wins yeah. with another person. Yeah, yeah. You're like, you're connected in this weird way that like, yeah, you just, without, without saying anything, it's like, if you go to a bar and you see somebody who's wearing a Sitka shirt, you're like, boom. Yeah. You know, cut from it, the same cloth. Yeah, Let's yeah, go, man. Where exactly. are you from? You know, and so it, it, that's, I don't know, man. I, I wish that upon everybody. I wish that they uh, get that chance to just honestly just go out one time. Yeah. Even if it's just, man, just hearing, like you said, hearing the bugle for the first time. Mm-hmm. My girlfriend called a turkey in for this past spring. I couldn't see it, but it had been like 10, 15 yards from her. And that one sh- gobble, I mean, the way her eyes lit up and she saw, I mean, that experience, I don't think she'll forget, but that, I mean, the sounds and you know the it's even if just getting out there with someone that does hunt even if you don't and just hearing that it's definitely open up your eyes versus what you know the normal eight to five job or going to the store it's 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 worth it for sure <laughs> it, it changes stuff <laughs> yeah. oh yeah well christian thank you so much man yeah, for coming man. on uh just for everybody too that's listening if they want to reach out to you because i don't want to let the uh I let, let let arrows fly thing die. So any yeah. anybody that wants to reach you, touch base with you, where can they reach you at on social? Social it is let arrows fly. So L E T A R R O W S F O Y. Um I'll post, you know, some of the stuff I do as far as you know, hunts and stuff and then every now and again if I come out with new swag hat or whatever, I'll kinda of throw something up there. I am kind of, that is kinda of one thing I'm working on right now. I've had a few questions is um, trying to get a website built up to where I can have everything, um, you know, quantities and stuff. So we're, mm-hmm. as far as ordering and getting stuff out, it's a little more uh, dialed in on that point. Nice. Let's um, get your website built. Squarespace.com, yeah. baby. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Need it, man. Cause I had someone today that wanted a couple things and he goes, how do, how do I go about doing this? And, you know, I'll always Venmo, get someone's Venmo and then send them the tracking number from the post office and, you know, everything works out. But I know for me personally, if I wanted to buy a hat, I'd be like, I just kind of want to go click enter my card and it'll be here and not have to do this kind of conversation, you know, yeah. through messages or whatever. And Clayson and I kind of started a thing on YouTube, same thing, let arrows fly to where we'll put these 3D shoots or hunts and um, kind of like, you know, just so people can experience it that can't be there. My dad, you know, health-wise, he can't physically go up a mountain or do these things, pull his bow back anymore. So being able to show, okay, we did this, check this out, this was cool. Uh, it's hard. It makes the difficulty go way up because you're trying to record. There's an extra person. There's that, there's all these extra elements, but that's something that we're kind of building on for fun and seeing where it goes is just, you know, sharing hunts or sharing yeah. this experience or even if it's... um. Like it'd be cool to do one where you're actually cleaning the animal out and you kind of show the process of it died right here. And mm-hmm. this is how you get onto your packs to the truck. Yeah. Cause it's, I mean, I've had people that were excited to go hunting, went out there and once they killed the animal, they're like, uh, what do I do now? What do I do? Dude, I think, uh, so yeah, that, that, that's a, that's a big deal. Um, and I don't, I don't want to go too much longer on that, but, um, uh, the, uh, I, the hush guys, uh, on their website, I think one of their YouTube, the one of the most played is them cleaning a bull in New Mexico. It's like one of the most played videos, yeah. right? It's like a how to, yeah. you know, I mean, for one, it's a, it's a massive animal, right? It's way different than getting a white tail and hanging it up on a freaking okay. tractor. Right. Yeah. So it's, you know, but no, yeah, I think that that's awesome, man. Um, well, I, you know, I, 
I appreciate you coming in, man. Yeah, it's, uh, enjoy it, man. It's it, it's it, sorry about having to cancel on you. The last oh, time I uh, I feel like a terrible person, but no. I was like, not only did I I didn't forget about the podcast, but I totally forgot about my daughter and having to go to Denver. And I was like, oh shit. Okay, either. <laughs> Uh, that's all good. It didn't <laughs> Either we let, my, we let my daughter down, or uh, so. But yeah, man. Um, yeah, we'll we'll put all the stuff in the show notes for you. Um, I'll talk to you about a website after this. Uh, yeah, uh, for because, sure. Because yeah, that's that's super simple. Yeah, and we got to get that popping. Because yeah. like, if you can sell gear, yeah. you just got to make it, make and it, and sell it. So. And that's that's another thing too. Is I started working with the QAD, getting my logo and stuff, and getting those out. And that's that's like, well, now I'm getting enough things product wise to choose from whether it be shirts or something that actually goes on your bow i kind of need to start you know getting it you know, a little bit more out there for not just instagram or facebook but actually get a website and um because now that you know the shoots the community so close i have you know i'll go to shoot and people in different states are kind of locking into it and figuring out what it is so it's definitely one of the steps i need to do soon for sure and yeah. kind of help grow it a little bit and see what happens i got some ideas that don't want to say, but some shirt ideas and stuff that I think will be pretty cool to take out and get people cruising around in them. Yeah, for sure, man. Swag is always good. I'm uh, I'm on the fence whether I want to do swag yeah. for the show just yet, but um, we'll see. I don't know, but <laughs> well, I, could, so I, could, I could totally get you a hat or shirt or whatever if what size you wear. I'll I'll oh, sell yeah. it for you. No, yeah, no, I'll buy it. We'll set up your website. And I'll buy it from you. Awesome, man. Yeah, Appreciate we'll it. Support you. Um, hell yeah. Thank you, brother. Yeah, that's Appreciate fun, you. Kyle. Are you listening? Damn.